Welcome to 155, a podcast about punk songs. My name is Josiah Hughes. And I'm Sam <laughs> Sutherland. <laughs> and this week, we're talking about the song. And we yes. thought that nation states were a bad idea, but propaganda. I, I, Gandhi. In my mind, that was like sort of, yeah, right? We're going to have, I think, I think we do this in the guest interview, maybe, if I you had to You keep telling everybody that I was so cruel in the guest interview that I feel like there's now hype about it. But I don't... I mean, I haven't listened back. I feel like I was... I don't know how I was. I guess we'll you find out. You opened up just like... You're usually pretty affable. And when you say things that are like... Could be considered caustic. They come... After you've lulled people into like a <laughs> sense of comfort, um, like I, I think of your interview mm. with Leo Diho during the Book of Fifty Five era, and, and like Leo Diho for people who somehow, well, we don't need don't to get into it. I mean, do you, no, that's fair. Basically, if you don't know who he is, you're and, lucky. And and you were like, what do you say to your haters if they're on the internet or perhaps interviewing you right now? And it's just like he was too dumb to understand that you were talking about how much you just liked. So you're it. comparing our and and I'm the bad one. You're comparing our guest to this guy. Yeah, I'm comparing our guest to like known <laughs> racist Tom DeLong impersonator Leo <laughs> Diaz. No, but I just thought we were having one type of conversation, and you just turned up the heat, and then. To be honest, it wasn't me hyping it up like wrestling promo style. You literally showed up in Discord like the day after we did the interview, just like next week's interview is fucking f- hot. So I, <laughs> I, I was rude as hell. <laughs> That's because you told me that after on the call. You're like, whoa, you're spicy. Anyways, maybe that'll happen. Well, I guess Who knows? We, I guess we'll <laughs> all find out. <laughs> but uh, like, um, don't skip ahead though. Don't miss any of the lead up to, to be, to, to to be fair, spiciest guest conversation. In case I'm yet. really cruel, to be fair. Uh, my cat Woody seems to be fine now, but he has been having some health struggles. And mm-hmm. I had like minutes before that happened, I had just gotten back from a particularly grueling uh, trip to the vet in a communauto where he was freaking out in the front. I mean, I was like not, I was not having it to begin with. And also, I don't, I haven't really worked out how I feel about this band or this song, and I, that's making me feel a little bit uh, backed into a corner and ready to spar. Well, I, I look forward to going round for round with you in our first episode about easily one of my top five favorite punk bands, bands. So you, you like, say this these, is like a big, you, it's right. like you want to say these big statements and then you hedge so much that it's like comes back to just it's one of I your like top them. 15 bands from Winnipeg that start with P. Or something. Propagandi is one of my five favorite bands of all time. There's no doubt in my mind. I will say that really? definitively on this podcast episode about Propagandis, and we thought the nation states were a bad idea. A song I don't particularly like. Just so wait, I got to put all this shit in the title. You've been calling it Nation States this whole time, as if you're writing the set list. But there's like a whole long ass title to it. And heads, heads, call it. Nation is there an states. ellipses in this song title too? It, oh, it, it actually starts with an ellipses. Nation States has a has a, a dash, which like I guess is correct. I mean, I assume Propagandi probably knew, but it's it's a verbose title for a verbose song. Just uh, your intention with the, you you came in this episode with <laughs> I was going to be of an intention. Evil. It wasn't just to bully our guests. No, and I um, mean, I mean, I probably did. You know, but thanks, you didn't follow through. Thanks for coming like, on, by the way, guests. Appreciate it. Can't remember your name. <laughs> <laughs> so. So maybe maybe tell the people a little bit about what you initially uh, were right yeah to do so I was episode. thinking and then why specifically you failed in your mission I wanted to fully be a heel and just pretend that I had heard the song and had thoughts about it but never actually listened to it and then at the very end of the episode reveal I had never heard it before but I realized that Sam's probably going to play like live videos and stuff like it would be sick if I had only ever heard the Todd Killings version or something that's kind of the ideal <laughs> yeah. way to hear a song but. Um, so I was going to reveal that at the very end after like talking my shit, I was going to reveal that I had never heard it. Um, and then that would be the big, the big magic trick. I I'm feeling evil this week, I think is what we're getting at here. Um, but then I realized, you know, you're going to play live video, so I, I'm going to hear it anyway. So I did listen to it right before we started and I kind of feel like it was exactly what I expected. And it did have, I still thought I could picture this band becoming the pop punk tool. 
and I think I'm still or the melodic hardcore or whatever they whatever they are now. Like I, I've I, this is the only propaganda song I've ever heard. It's kind of exactly what I expected, um, and I've just for some reason I don't have the mental vocabulary for it or i just don't really it doesn't connect with me in any kind of way i just like don't understand any of it i think it's because when i was younger i read ad busters specifically for the graphic design and it actually just made me love the nike logo a lot um so i don't really like you know this just feels like it's someone trying to read howard's in as fast as possible while uh while you hear two different jam space bands jamming out at once Listen, um, it, it's it's great that you dropped Howard's in because uh, one of the books that I rest my laptop on in order to bring it up to a high level because I'm old and, and my so neck short. And, <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's because I'm tall. I have to oh, bring yeah, the computer up true, to my right. staggering height, actually. So, well, uh, you are sitting on a phone book as well while you do it. <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> it's a whole thing. I just want to look cool if someone were to walk into the room, which is silly. Sure, there's no, obviously no one in my house. But uh, I, I I do rest my laptop on a copy of uh, People's History of the United States. <laughs> wow. Yeah, which which I have never finished. <laughs> I mean, I've never even cracked it open. Really. I mean, I bought it at one point. I got it at like a you know used bookstore. It's like a hardcover. Like it's it's great for resting your laptop on. And as in the, my experience, uh, as the evil, not much else. As the evil one this week, I'm just going to go full out with it. With it is like I kind of feel like to me. What you're describing is what I've always imagined propaganda to be like. And my understanding of like epitaph, fat wreck related stuff and hyper political stuff does boil down to the word greedyocracy and to the McDonald's manager who determined who was punk or not and loved the Pennywise album Land of the Free. And so for me, it's kind of like I just think that because this band is lumped in with that stuff, I feel like even though I know that they're like, you know, true, uh, like extreme vegans and they, they practice what they preach and they're like the real deal or whatever, capital R, capital D. I still feel like it's contextually, there's this level of posturing that I associate with propaganda that I've never really been able to like wrap my head around to the point where I don't really want to listen to it. I think probably if I'm being honest and I know thankfully no one's listening, so it's fine. I'm not going to get yelled at, but yeah, this is just you and me having a conversation. But I just feel like it's like, it's kind of like how people always would name drop Fugazi when they're talking about DIY or they, oh, like, it's like, to me, this is like a, a, a band that people name drop in order to have cred in a way. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know that it goes as far as, as the like requisite, Fugazi name drop, but I think it's it's fair to view the band that way, and they occupy such totally unique space in sort of like punk culture or like just like wider, you know, political musical culture. Like if you include, you know, I don't know, like Billy Bragg or like even like other sorts of like more sort of folk specific artists, you know what is propaganda's responsibility to themselves and their audience does the like excessive verbiage does the like you know footnotes in the lyrics do all those things sort of add up in a way that for lack of a better way to say it, like makes a difference or is it all part of like a posture that many of us have where we own People's history of the United States, but it's used to hold up our Apple products. And I, and I, I honestly do think that the that that sort of critique of anything is totally useless. It's the it's that meme of the guy popping out of the ground saying, "But you, but you oh, participate." Yeah. Like it's it is that. I was thinking it's, about that exactly. That like it, it is propaganda are like truly at least critiques of them in many ways defined very simply by the uh, like we should improve society somewhat. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. Participate in society. Interesting. But meme. I guess like, to me, like the the large scale version of that critique is whether or not you think Rage Against the Machine's political activity or, or uh, you know, discussion and, and output actually has any real-world consequence or, or accomplishes anything. But ultimately, I think it doesn't matter because Rage Against the Machine fucking slaps and they're sick as all hell. And to me, propaganda, I don't really get the, the slap 
the slapness. It, it's not sick to me. It's it's just kind of like I, I get why people like it, but it's it's not far off from like Rush or something to me. It's too like yeah. there's just something about it that's too much. It's just like every, there's just too much happening at once. All there's a lot of good things happening. I I agree. <laughs> um, it's interesting that you would compare this song to Rush because like this to me, and, and you know I said this a little bit in the introduction, like. I did not get into propaganda in this era. Like, this is sort of before my time. And then when I went back to it, I was like, huh. Because there is a very distinct demarcation point in this band's career where you have two albums that are, like, very pop punk. And, like, this to me doesn't sound... You saying you could sense them kind of getting to the pop punk tool stuff and it's there like the guitar is like it's it's very riffy it's like it does not sound exactly like the other stuff that was happening in the kind of epifat universe but it's sort of like of a piece and like we discovered this like in our in our trip to you know trip to the lake with the kokanee boys lag wagon last week mm-hmm. it's like there were a lot of bands doing sort of heavily technical stuff in mm-hmm. this time that like that wasn't necessarily the focal point but it was sort of present in the music and, and definitely like we get into like very serious rush era in a few albums. But part of me genuinely wondered when you listen to this, if you would, if you would end up loving it, I do wonder if like a slightly different version of it would have sounded better to you. Cause I imagine you heard the version of it that's on less talk, more rock, which is like, recorded by Ryan green. who's the guy who like does all the no effects stuff. Like it sounds like to me when I, first went back and listened to these propaganda albums after listening to Let's Talk More Rock, or after listening to Today's Empire's Tomorrow's Ashes, which is like way thrashier, way heavier. At the time, didn't sound really like anything else I had listened to. I went back and I was like, this band just kind of sounds like no effects to me. And that's because it was like produced to sound exactly like no effects. And I even think Chris kind of sings like he's Fat Mike in this there was, era. There was definitely like... I- yeah, I mean, also, uh, I assume everything... Oh, baby, like, I think, when when this song was recorded. Everything I've said so far is going to make people think I, like, absolutely hate it. And I honestly, like, I wasn't offended by it. I just, I can't, like, I just can't wrap my head around any of this. It just, like, doesn't make sense to me. It's like... Oh, I do want to play this, because I think this might help, because this song, like, was also on a split that they did with I Spy, which is the band that Todd, who eventually joined the band when Junkie Sampson left, was in... And he was also in this band, Swallowing Shit, that was like a proper kind of like metal band. Anyway, the version of this that was on that I Spy split and was actually on the Survival of the Fattest comp. And this is like where you hear people who I think are like, in some cases, maybe a couple of years older than us, where like you and me, it was like Punkorama 3. We talked a lot about that in the No Effects episode. We talked a lot about that in the compilation episodes. Like those, those were the comes for us. Survival of the Fattest is like a little earlier. And the version of the song that is like from that 10 inch split and from this comp feels so much more like that thing that we talk about all the time of like the sick local band. And so I do want to listen to it for like a fucking second. Cause sure. I sort of wonder yeah. if like, there's just like more different context clues, you know, that like might ultimately lead you to, you know, appreciate, appreciate the boys more. I mean, we've still uh, got the skip of the foreplay vocal cover up on our watch together, which by the way, uh, kind of similar sort of like a music with a message about taking down the king or whatever. Check that out. Patreon.com slash 155pod. The Skip the Foreplay episode with another classic epitaph Canadian band. Yeah, they, they are like basically the same, I think. Okay, hold on. I was having some trouble here, but I think... I think there we go. Think we here we go. go. There we go. Like, it's just... Even this part, I'm like... It does sound like a pretty sick skate punk riff, but I just like... There's still a little bit too much showing off. It reminds me of like Layaway Plan or something. Oh, like all that what other a band. kind of stuff <laughs> from that era. But this is like that this guitar. Yeah, that's cool. Some Rick Ocasek tone. I think the problem is just the lyrics for me. I mean, it's like big time. Like, you know, I'm getting it all in, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's like... Sounds like Hamilton to me. 
<laughs> okay, so once I'm again, gonna get killed by I think someone. I think it rocks. Yeah, you, you're you're. This is this is not going to end well for you. People know so. which neighborhoods you live in. You keep getting <laughs> <laughs> you keep being outed and doxed on the on the Discord. So by Bill from Silverstein. Really also, this episode, you want, want we need, to know where Josiah lives. Just uh, join the Patreon. Bill from Silverstein doxed me after you doxed him. Have you cited him since then? I mean, we should keep this going with this doxing back and forth with Bill <laughs> yeah, from yeah, yeah, until someone's seriously injured. <laughs> That's what we're waiting for. So I mean, I'm happy. The, I'm like, happy cool that you guys. Like it. I'm happy that you <laughs> like it. I'm. I. You know. I'm glad. I just. Yeah. It's the lyrics. I think for me is like. I, I think what there's something about it that's like. It's all message, but there's no like finesse or po- it. It doesn't feel poetic to me, or like it doesn't feel like. It feels almost. It's like all message and no, uh, artistry. To the sense, to the point where, like, it may as well be Christian music, honestly, but it's just about a different kind of message. You know what, like, is is frustrating about this episode? You know, because this is for anyone for some reason listening. This is their first episode. This is, I believe, the last song now as part of our our Epithet Month, mm-hmm. which has been a, a wonderful journey, and all the songs have been from compilations, which. Meant that we were really trying to capture like the essence of that like '90s kind of epithet sound and culture, and so as I've said, it takes like another album for me to be like Propaganda or one of the five greatest bands of all time. And so when you offer those critiques, I'm like, yeah, you are right. Like you're not real. Like in the long term, you're not right. And when you sort of cast off into the future and say they're just going to sound like Rush, I'm like, you're wrong and you're and you're and you're foolish. Right. And you're but but did the, the later yourself. the later albums. And also, I got to say, now that we're kind of, you know, we fucked up the whole timeline, it doesn't really matter anymore. When you and our guests this week are talking about different yeah. propaganda songs, they all sound so fake to me. It's so funny. It sounds like you're making it up as you go along. You're like, oh, yeah, was this as good as a uh, uh, Borders policeman? Uh, I can't even think of something to Borders say. Borders policeman is a really good propaganda there's song. Like, there's definitely. so many. And, and the shorthand for it is so funny. Like, I just feel like it's like. It's kind of like a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or something. I just feel like I don't understand, and I, and I, I don't want to be super disrespectful, but also it's it is my show, and so I got to say my things to hurt your feelings specifically. It's, I'm not I'm not hurt if we if we were start talking about like again today's Empire's Potemkin City Limits, like, and then you were saying all this stuff, like then I'd start doxing Potemkin you. City Limits. Like that, does that sound like a real title to anyone? How do you, like that's. Well, it's in many up. ways, it doesn't. That's very a little bit of a double entendre. <laughs> so, what if what if I told you that there's a great live video of this band playing in 1994, where they use it as an opportunity to shit on a band that you dislike? I think even more than Propagandi. Maybe you'd be interested. Oh. Maybe you'd be interested then. Wow, they knew about idols back then. <laughs> in the future, there's going to be a, a performatively feminist band. And it's just, it's too much. The, the videos of them playing in the 90s are amazing there's because they're also on that 10 inch that's not here. It's tiny. And it's called we Tiny Boys. It's for a bad idea. It's basically about recognizing who is controlling the society for whose benefit. And it's not a big revelation. It's the rich for the rich at the expense of the poor. Uh, it's a traditional thing, I guess. Let me just go ahead and also tell you something else. Like, <laughs> Go ahead. The, hearing this part, I, I also just... I think the other problem is just that I've always been so immature and stupid and uh, have ADHD, I think, probably. Or I don't know. I mean, I haven't... I haven't fully embraced the uh, adult ADHD and all of the. We all have adult ADHD. I would like to. I'm, I'm just waiting for the time when I feel like I. Could. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? I want to. Yeah, I want to get on. I'm still waiting. I feel like the, I've got enough other things popping off right now. But when there's a lull, I'm going to really lean into those identities online. But That's sick. I've always felt like you know, like just like I'm too. I I would go to a show and I just like have too much energy and all I want to do is like put gold bond on my balls with my friends in the parking lot or just like throw light bulbs that we dumpstered are like just be so i was just way too annoying so the, the hearing <laughs> this is like i've been to these kinds of shows and the problem is that i was just like always wanting to goof around and just like throw something at my friend's balls from across the room so the, like that's the other problem is just like oh yeah i agree this, with this these things in theory but it's just the the uh yeah i'm just i'm too immature for this kind of thing hasn't changed the thing that has changed is just picturing um, you in the back 
Just be throwing shit at your friend's balls. We can, especially the punk scene, tend to blame the whole situation on the government, on the state. But the state seems to, the way the world is constructed now, seems to only play uh, some sort of puppet or lapdog uh, to multinational corporations who own everything and control everything and exploit workers and, and teach us to be stupid. So that's what that song is about, recognizing the lowest common de denominator of all of us in North America uh, who aren't of the 2% who own everything is that we're going to be part of the working class someday or already are, or the unemployed class. And that should be some sort of rallying point uh, for reform or some sort of revolution, even though that sounds corny and romantic. So, so yeah. And that might start with recognizing that the punk scene is a microcosm of what we do in real life. Recognizing that a boycott, such as the Metro, is an important thing. So, or, or not, just watch where you put your money. I mean, if you don't want to give your money to major labels and shitty promoters in the punk scene, don't give it to, you know, try to minimize your participation outside the scene by not supporting large corporations there either. Or vice versa, if you don't want to support GM or Budweiser outside the scene, why support the Metro or Bad Religion inside the scene? <laughs> they have nothing to do with the punk community. <laughs> I mean, that was about 15 minutes of talking. And these, these guys had an album called Less Talk, More Rock? Well, that's that, the joke. Okay. There was a lot of monologuing. But look, I mean, he, he, he got a dunk in on, on bad religion. So I, thought, I thought you might. I did. Like, that was great. Yeah. Um, but I also, oh, yeah, that, that does make me want to ask. So this is 94. When were they on? Like, why have they been on every label? It seems like they're the problem, ultimately, <laughs> that they keep switching labels. But also... It, there's also a propagandi like beef with no effects at some point and they had like they were they're like the pusher or they're like the drake and kanye of their time like making dunks at each other i guess i saw a whole bunch of album covers in a row that that were like referencing each other and dunking on each other so what's the deal propagandi kind of they they go on these labels but then they're also like you should talk them like this i mean that's kind of yes cool. bite bite the hand that feeds you know no so uh like the story is that they get signed to fat um fat puts out the first two albums and then mike gives them the money to start g7 uh, and G7 put out obviously some amazing records during its its time, um, and so they're obviously Sounds like, like Noam Chomsky new. spoken word shit. Yeah, also. it was always like you were like fuck yeah, like a new Weaker Than's record, and then also something the spoken like word the thing most I will boring thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <in my life. laughs> yeah, hundred percent. And uh, and then I, the schism really happens around Rock Against Bush um, because. Fat Mike becomes like radicalized to the center, um, and we've talked sort of extensively about right. like, his Hillary's you know, tweet, like, the best thing. Yeah, I've he ever becomes happened. he he becomes like with her, kind of starting in that moment. And, He's and proto with change. her, and and I think this is like sort of where this like interesting kind of thing happens for propaganda because I think it was sort of like the politics were always front and center, but maybe it was kind of fine because they were like the only political band in the sphere, but they played like the same type of music. So it sort of made sense for them to be on those tours, on those labels. And then all of a sudden, I think there was like a very real, like political disagreement there where um, like Mike, as part of those campaigns was like taking money from fuck for the life of me. I can't, you know, some like billionaire philanthropist who was like financing the sort of, Oh, filthy Phil philanthropist. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and so propaganda refused to take part in any of the rock against Bush stuff. And basically we're like, the Democrats are no different than the Republicans very much ahead of their time in terms of, you know, um, in terms uh, of saying don't was, vote. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so there's like a split that happens there and they don't put any records on fat and then they start taking shots at each other. So propaganda, you have a song called rock, uh, rock for sustainable capitalism, which is like fucking sick and basically like making fun of warp tour bands and no effects and fat records. And then no effects, right? Like two diss songs of a propaganda. So there's like a fucking horrible no effects song called the Marxist brothers. That's all like about how, you know, propaganda and rage against the machine are just like alienating people with their divisive rhetoric. And it is this fucking bad. 
Um, <laughs> is, this like a, is this an actual No Effects album with Jesus on the cover that says Never Trust a Hippie, or is it like a... Yeah, I think so. Or was it like a shirt? Or this is like deep in not giving a fucking shit about No Effects. Um, but they like, li- like literally in this song reference Today's Empire's Tomorrow's Ashes. And then they have another song called One Celled Creature, and so is like a prison cell. That seemingly references the propaganda album art, yeah, for Potemkin City Limits. And then there's like shit on propaganda's blog about them. Like it's fucking. <laughs> it's one of those things that like I started to 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 sort of research for the purposes of this episode because it seems like an interesting part of like Epifab Month until I realized it's not interesting. Like it's truly. I mean, fucking I stupid. absolutely love. Band beefs. I've always loved band beefs. Okay, well then maybe you'll love this. This is the, the marginally better song. So this song is called, uh, and this is at least more subtle as like diss tracks go. Um, so yeah, this is called One Celled Creature, and it references uh, uh, life on a mattress in a robe. And I think if you're on Genius, the image is linked there because for a while. Uh, Chris Hanna was doing a thing kind of like, um, oh my god, what was the fake what was the fake fucked up manager called again? David Elliott? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Chris Hanna was Glenn Lambert, who I think was like a fake member of Propagandi for a while, and he would just post these like truly pathetic photos of himself. Um, but like, the, you know, Knowledge has much better uses than self pity and superiority. Like Man, really, Melvin's voice sounds really good. I uh, it's funny you mentioned bureaucracy because a couple of nights ago, just like waiting for like waiting to eat or something, I put on the decline at Red Rocks with the orchestra video. Oh, and yeah. Oh my god, it's so fucking great. <laughs> Did laugh at bureaucracy. Um, the orchestra shit is so awesome, but it was great because like Ashley was out of the room and like just didn't come back. Like it was just like <laughs> everything sounds so annoying. <laughs> like everything that's happening in the review orient is like so annoying. I'm just gonna like wait till it's over and read a book. Um, so did did Propagandi like drop their Adonis in this, in all of this, or did they just not did they not release any music? They just were like quietly like well, because oh. Propagandi puts out a record like every ten fucking years, but like really like like the Propagandi. Saw like diss track um, is 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 again rock for sustainable capitalism, which now we should just listen to, I guess, because we're sort yeah, of sorry. I've already derailed the episode because this is in what I'm the, interested in. The in. Dis, in the diss zone already. <laughs> um, Speaking of fucked up, I, like I loved on that early fucked up mixtape where I think like Billy Talent tried to get into their sold out fucked up weekend show, and they thought that the guy from Billy Talent was being a rock star, and so. There yeah, was like a yeah. song about eating a cheeseburger. If you want a beef, I'm going to make a fucking cheeseburger. There's like a Billy Talent diss song. Um, I once made a mixtape. This guy, there, <laughs> there's this guy. Oh, never mind. This is more of no, a, no, 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 no. More Charles, of a please, please. story. Well, there's uh-huh. there's this guy that like shit talked me once, and we happened to be in a in a mixtape club together where pe- we, people would make each other mixtapes, and I got his his uh, name out of the hat, and I had seen that he had been shit talking me on one of my articles, and so. Because I was like such a fucking nerd, my mixtape for him was all diss tracks only. Um, yeah, and that's he was, funny. But he didn't obviously know why, and he was like, "Oh, I love this! What a great concept!" And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> "That is good." You're, can you chat me? Who do I know? Who it no, is? No, you don't. I don't even remember his name. But um, oh wow, good for you. <laughs> so this is in, in terms of yeah. So this is like propaganda's side of the diss track, which is like fuck this song goes man and this is where like I think they become much more adept at like expressing admittedly that's a little verbose but like complicated ideas in a hooky way as opposed to just being like which like is absolutely like that defines that earlier Right? Ooh, like these yeah. are basically Mars Volta lyrics, but uh, but about different. Yeah, this is pretty yes. sick though. It does sound pretty good. Yeah. 
Yeah. But like this, ba- I just feel like it's so nerdy. Like you keep sending me the genius links, but every time I look up a propaganda song, it, it links me to their web page where they have the official lyrics. Like, <laughs> yeah. like they're trying to teach me so much at once. And I'm just trying they to really chill. Are. Well, and so here's like, look, I, I think there um, is another podcast that does the like getting into the the footnotes, the meaning of every line in a propaganda song. No one is coming to us for that, and and I don't think that's the point. But the thing, the idea that I kept circling and that you touched on right off the top, and that I, I am really interested to know what you think about this is like I have gone through waves as like a very idealistic young person to then like a I don't give a fuck about anything young person to a like newly idealistic middle young person to now like whatever on earth I am now. And, and how I feel about propaganda has has sort of, I think mapped with that in a way that like, I personally think is interesting where like initially I discovered them and I was like, this is so fucking inspiring. This is how I'm going to live my life. And then I'm like, well, okay, I'm not going to be vegan and so then, like, am I just picking and choosing? And then I and then you just get to the point where you're like, I don't give a shit about any of this. And, like, you know, there was a moment where Propagandi had refused to do an interview with Exclaim because they didn't <laughs> like some of the advertisers that we had. And then they had, like, premiered a track with MySpace. And it just, like, it was, like, a real, like, and yet you participate in society thing where I was yeah. like, okay, you cannot be this person and have – coherent beliefs like you just can't and so it's stupid to even fucking try and i was like and then i was like and it's all fucking bullshit and it's posing and now i'm just like well everyone does their fucking best right and you pick your battles and you do your best i I mean but i think okay but so 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 that's that's my position and that's i think where i've landed in a very comfortable place as like as a propaganda fan who recognizes that i'm like not one of those people who you work for universal records (laughs) i work for universal music i eat meat like i do a lot of things but there are at least other things in my life that i think i've taken from them in a really positive way and i think that that's enough right okay uh, but so my question for you is like, how do you feel about a band like this existing in the space that they do? Yeah, I think Taking the, the similar. The, I think the fan base like is is it a net positive? Like, because on some level, to me, that's the question, right? Is like if this band's goal is is expressly political, and it and it is right. This isn't like a band that has one or two political songs. Is is that like a noble pursuit? Is it a success? Is it a failure? I, this is sort of like an abstract rhetorical question that yeah. I've asked like in two different ways. I think uh, it reminds me of a lot of being a Godspeed fan when I was a teenager and reading mm. like brainwashed.com or dot or whatever the fuck was their website where it was like scans of typewriter shit on cardstock. And I remember they were just like, always go fucking in on Radiohead and shit on Radiohead all the time and the like fake now debunked image of all the major labels and how they're tied to weapons manufacturing companies and all this stuff and like I think that all of those things are are interesting and it's it's an interesting conversation to have and they also used to hate on Exclaim and never want to talk to Exclaim and you know uh, it's all very interesting but I think the problem is that it's too epic and everyone's just like trying to be epic all the time. And it's, it reminds me a lot of like people on Twitter now who are like, you know, they're all going to like half of the people who are famous on Twitter for doing epic dunks politically are going to either fizzle out or become like post left or, or something even scarier whenever that change, whenever the tides shift. And so I think the problem with packaging stuff like this in culture and in music and in film or whatever, you know, TV even, like, look at something like uh, John Oliver. Like, the problem is that if it's tied to culture, then because culture and trends shift, it's going to become lame. And then if your message is tied up with that, then your message is going to seem lame at the same time. So it's kind of like, that's why I think it's ineffective because for until three years ago, Rage Against the Machine was pretty fucking corny for the last 10 years or whatever. And now they're on like an upward trajectory again. So I just think the problem is like, the problem is that music and things like that are so trend based. And then if, if it's all message, then you run the risk maybe of your message seeming corny too. But at the same time, like, I don't know, I have a lot of respect for punk and hardcore bands that 
really do live these things and like make it their whole front and center thing. I, I think the other thing that I always was confused by was like, why not just start a hardcore band then if you want to make it like this? But I don't know. I'm just obviously. I, I love about it. So okay, there's a, the few things I really think are interesting, which is like, I, I, I get this and I sometimes feel the same way, but I think it's so funny to frame things in like, damn, you're going to sound corny. You know, it's like, is that the greatest possible sin? Like, is that, is <laughs> well, that the worst thing that could happen to you? But that's, that's the flip side of, thinking that something's a net good because it might be getting the message to some teens, which is the, I think the maximum you can accomplish with wrapping music up in messages is that you can reach teens and hopefully one of them one day will learn how to organize and fix everything while the rest of us are like thinking about what label something came out on. Like I I think being corny is the flip side of the positive, which is just maybe a teen will hear it and hopefully figure out all the shit that we can't figure out. Yeah, I mean, I, there's a few things that I think are interesting. You being like, why not just start a hardcore band? I love that because I think that I remember when we did the final episode of Blink-55 and, and we both kind of were talking about what had happened with that show and what it, what it sort of what about it had sort of meant the most to us and something that I know that I said in that in that last episode and – um, something that I feel very strongly about the entire experience of this podcast is that outside of propaganda, and this is what I realized, is like literally outside of propaganda, it's always felt to me like being even performatively, like politically and socially conscious, felt like it belonged to other genres, right? It belonged to like certain strains of hip hop, it belonged to certain strains of punk, and it and it did not belong to the punk that I just like liked listening to. And I'm not so fucking smart that I can listen to music from a purely intellectual standpoint. Like ultimately the music that I like, I, I, I'm not hearing context. I'm not often really hearing content. You know, like what I am hearing is like, I like how these chords go together and that's it. That's fucking it. That's the only reason that I really listen to anything more than fucking once is like, because it resonated in some way in this like very base, simple fashion. And, and so I loved when we did, Blink 55 and all this great shit happened and we were able to like raise like, you know, over $10,000 for Black Lives Matter last summer. And we did all this stuff that like, to me, I always felt like was the domain of like other people's culture. You know, it was like the, the hardcore bands that were able to, to do that stuff because ultimately like, because it was baked into their whole fucking thing, it was just like, that's where those people were who really cared. And that's where it felt most authentic to, to, to like help out and try to do your fucking part or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and I think like propaganda is, is a piece of that saying like, you can just be like very fucking in to pop punk and like lightly into metal and not even into like the really political metal. You just be into the metal that like feels fucking good to listen to and still like care about other things and still make that like a really meaningful part of your life but the you know the funny thing about what you just said that is interesting to me is that if i agree with you and that was like so fulfilling in so many ways and just the i mean i don't want to start doing a bunch of humble bragging but there's been so many different things that came out of that project Mm -hmm. that have been just insanely fulfilling but from a distance someone will say blink 155 was a show about calm and that's kind of the difference is that like, we, I think yeah. that just came from us kind of like propaganda is a band about come also. Well, yeah, I mean, if you can tell me that propaganda is come, then I'm listening. If, if something in this means come, then I'm down. <laughs> yeah, that's what it takes. <laughs> um, no, that's fair. I, I, I guess I, I respect the idea of thinking like, here are the things that occupy my thoughts. And this is the other thing that I believe is, you know, like having done enough interviews with these dudes like over the the years of like writing about punk in this country is like this is this is legitimately what they care about like it's not like when you hang out with them they're like it's i mean obviously this in hockey and everyone knows that like if this is the thing that occupies your thoughts and these are the bands that you like that's going to be the thing you're going to write about you know like the reason that you write the songs that you write is because it's a mixture of the shit that is in your fucking brain and the bands you like like i'm like i think about aging and being miserable and I really like 
you know, one Lawrence Arms record, and that's what Junior Battle sounds like, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so I kind of respect the idea of, like, all of my thoughts are consumed by thinking that, you know, nation states were a bad idea, um, but I'm also really into pop punk, and so, like, this is just what happens. And I appreciate how not calculated that seems, because it would be so easy to be either a pop punk band that's saying about things that were, like, more palatable to like the, the, the very top of the kokanee, you know, uh, beer funnel <laughs> or to, to lean into your like kind of metal and hardcore interests and like, just be a fucking proper ass political band. And I think there's like something deliberate about deciding to exist in that middle ground that I find really compelling. Yeah, that, no, that's fair. And I, I do always appreciate like the, being the loudest band in the indie scene or the softest band playing hardcore. But, like, it is interesting to kind of be... They definitely are, have their own, like, identity. And, and it is very clear that it's... Like you said, there's nothing calculated about it. I think it's just, like... It's so overwhelmingly earnest also that I, I think I just wasn't... Like, I don't know. I just, I, I've just never been able to connect with it. And the other really funny thing is that I was born in Winnipeg and I lived there, you know only when I was very little, but I've been back a bunch. And like, it's interesting to me that part of who I am is also such a big part of who these people are. I don't know if they still live in Winnipeg or not, but, um, and then then I also get the impression that Winnipeg is for the most part, even like the indie bands and stuff, there is this like extreme political, uh, like, guiding force behind the lyrics and there's always this intentionality of making sure that things are very like like i can't think of like a silly band from winnipeg other than uh, not they're not silly but to me my favorite band from winnipeg as we've already talked about is comeback kid obviously um but it's so different from from propaganda because mostly about like living your life with no regrets and stuff (laughs) you know what's funny is uh I've, i've been to winnipeg like a handful of times but the first time I went was for, of course, the Winnipeg Fringe Festival, as you do when you are a true punk. <laughs> and like dead in the center of town, like in sort of like the like literally like the main s- square, you know, like not far from the Royal Albert, like legendary where he's new recorded, like you know the live album, like you know in the the fucking pocket where everything happens. There is a building that on the first floor and it, it has since shut down, which is a fucking shame. This like cafe slash radical bookstore called Mondragon. And you like walk into it and you're like, ah, I see. Like this is just like the social center mm-hmm. in a way that like, you know, when you're on tour, right? Like sometimes you, you like, especially when you're younger and you're like really trying to be punk, you like check out the anarchist bookstore or whatever. And be like, <laughs> tight, tight, tight. But you're never like in Tallahassee at the anarchist bookstore. Like I can see why Tallahassee is so punk. Like it's so obvious. Like Mondragon is like the center of that city. And then, then you realize like, Oh, that's like literally where all those dudes worked. And you know, that's in that building. There's like all of these, Nonprofits, and that's where G7's offices were. And you're like, oh, there is just like a very strong, and it obviously has to do with the like history of that city from like a union standpoint. Generally, like a the the sort of prairies is like the the sort of birthplace of kind of radical politics in this country. But it's like, you know, that's like fine in a theoretical way. But it's like, who are the bands and where are the places that you hang out when you're younger? And that just completely informs your worldview. But it, you're right; it's funny because you're like, oh, Greg McPherson, just like a sort of Springsteeny singer star, like highly, political, you know what I mean. There's yeah. no like, there's no half-ass politics that come from that city. Yeah, it's kind of which is interesting. Um, I, you know, what's funny is like I listen to you so little when you talk that every time you describe being born or growing up somewhere, I feel like you're adding somewhere new to the list. <laughs> I know. Where you're like, you know, everyone knows, of course, that I was born on a on a cod fishing boat. You know, off the, I was just off the coast of St. every John. time just making yeah. it up. No, I, everyone knows that I was born deep in the bottom of a mine in Sudbury. <laughs> I'm like, holy! I don't fuck, remember man. where I was born in Winnipeg, but that's I was born in Winnipeg. And then I lived there until I was five. And then I lived in Scotland while my dad did his PhD there. And then 
And speaking of PhDs, we got to give an on pod shout out w- to Fiona. We, do. we fucking absolutely have to do absolutely this. Yes. shout out to Fiona, Doctor Schick. I think it's official. Congratulations on your PhD. <laughs> it's been. <laughs> I can't believe you somehow did it while you've been listening to our show. Also, that's incredible. It's that's the, the most remarkable. I feel yeah. like you should get bonus doctor points for that. <laughs> exactly. like, that you were like you should be double doctor points and minusing <laughs> them at the same time. Like that's an achievement. <laughs> But anyways, for the official record, of, I don't know who's keeping notes. I've lived in Scotland from there in Edinburgh, and then my family moved to Abbotsford, and then I stayed okay. in Abbotsford and Langley in Vancouver for most of my formative years. I'm not this man. I, you know what I'm thinking a bit is like, you know, because the, the, the pronunciation of Fiona's last name is like borderline subtle, and I was still, I think, clapping when you said it, and I thought, you're like, finally a doctor chick, and I was like, guy, you cannot say that. <laughs> You can't call them chicks yeah, you can. <laughs> There are doctor <laughs> chicks. So are you going to talk about how on Propagandi's Wikipedia page, it links to an Exclaim article by you called Propagandi Aren't Sexy from 2005? Because that's kind of a funny. <laughs> Christ. Uh, no, I actually stayed off the Wikipedia because I was like, either we're going to go deeper. And then I sort of like made an attempt to say, or like, there's a lot of ways to go deep on Propagandi. And they've kind of basically already provided you with that. I was like actually much more interested in... In Entrapment, making that. me, everyone hates, now, now I can't. No, because I think this is an interesting, uh, you know, when your stated goals are so clear and it's not like, let's have a good time. Like when, when your existence seems sort of very much like predicated on advancing a very specific agenda, um, I think it's only logical to sort of judge things against that agenda with that agenda in mind. Like, you know, you mentioned Godspeed. Like, I've fucking dined out on how fucking funny I think it is that they won the Polaris Music Prize here in Canada, like our Mercury Prize, you know, three, four, five, six, seven years ago, uh, which comes with like $50,000 kind of cash prize or whatever. And they very publicly were like, we're not accepting it. Or the way it got written about it was that they turned it down, but they didn't. That they, you know, took the money and then they said that they were going to use it to start a program um, to get uh, musical instruments to prisoners in the Canadian prison system. And that was like the headline. And it was great. It's a really great idea. But like several years later, like I remember being like, did anything fucking happen with that? And like finally found an interview where they were like, yo, it's actually really fucking hard to do anything <laughs> in the, in corrections in Canada. Like, they of keep course, fashioning of knives course. out of the uh, guitars. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, of course. But then, so the headline really is, and again, because at the time the headlines were all like, Godspeed rejects. Like, I think there was, because that year was sponsored by Toyota, right? So it was like, Godspeed rejects your fucking bullshit ass car money. Like, fuck you, Toyota. Fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> they just took the money. Like, they just had, like, that's just like 50 grand from Toyota that Godspeed has. But they, like, made a lot of noise. Well, they also would they, like they would so epically long before that they would so epically talk about how all the movies that they turned down because they're not a soundtrack band, and then their music was featured in uh, Twenty Eight Days Later. Which yeah, is like, you know what rules about that is the Twenty Eight Days Later soundtrack is a mixture of Godspeed songs and then score that is written to sound exactly like Godspeed songs. And one time I was watching an episode of America's Got Talent. Um, where there was a guy being shot out of a cannon and they started playing one of the, what I now realize is the Godspeed sound alikes from 28 days later. But I'm like sitting there being like, Holy shit. Did Godspeed get so fucking hard up that they're licensing their songs to America's Got Talent? Just like Howie Mandel and Howard Stern, like clutching their heads as a man That's is shot so out of a cannon. Sick. Man, and it, it turned so out it was sick. simply the 28 Days Later soundtrack and not actual Godspeed. Like, also, again, like, all this stuff about Godspeed and the hypocrisy, which is just human, uh, I think their music is really sick. And uh, without any of that context, I still really like it. So that's just why Propagandi, I think, is never connected. Like, I've heard bits and pieces before, or maybe it has just been the people trying to show me or whatever. It's just, it's just like, I, I still think ultimately... M- a piece of art needs to stand on its own as a piece of art outside of the message. And obviously that's subjective as well. But for me yeah, personally, personal, it doesn't. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of the issue. But I also got to shout out Blair right now who uh, showed members of Godspeed my 
Uptown Funk Godspeed cover <laughs> that you can hear on the Howl Dotty <laughs> podcast. Um, yeah, <laughs> which is like it's a real all time Josiah achievement. It's like, one it of is, the most embarrassing things I've ever done. Remarkable. I love how you're like, damn. There's a danger of being corny if you're Rage Against Machine or Propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I mean an Uptown you Funk speed just dropped. <laughs> like right at that. That's the hook, yeah. right? Godspeed just dropped. Uh, and and Blair <laughs> showed members of Godspeed and, and sent me a screenshot of one of them saying, "Yeah, Ephraim said this is the worst thing he's ever heard in his life." So I mean, I'm just happy to know that we're still kind of the the dialogue has started, and so I'm um, ready. I'm ready. If Ephraim, if you have, this is an open call, Ephraim, if you ever want to come over and play Call of Duty, I'll, I'll show you how to play it. I think it'd be really fun. You think Ephraim thinks that shooting games are? You know, like evil, or do you think that's how he like gets his yayas out? I'm watching. Uh, I'm watching this happen right now, actually, with someone in Winnipeg who I'm not going to name names, but it's pretty obvious. But right right now, this person is working on a, a very serious uh, book, mm. political book, and how he blows off Call of Duty. How he blows off steam is he plays Call of Duty with me all the time, and, and he's like the really? most that's... staunch leftist I've ever met, and he's definitely. Uh, I, I can hear the internal crisis while he does it but i mean it's fucking fun there's no there's no denying it well you know what else is fun josiah uh, ska <laughs> <laughs> before we get to uh, our guest he's been waiting patiently right. in silence while, and some, while i was talking about how it happened the interview you and i already. you and i moved through time in a in a sort of <laughs> way that science has yet to nail down perhaps doctor of the pod fiona stick can um Shit. Not sh- it's not shtick. It's shick. It's sh- is that sh- shit? You said shtick. I do shtick. Feel shtick. You know. <laughs> shtick. Okay, I got sh- it. Shick, so- shicks dig it. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, Fiona. I apologize for trying to take you down a peg. Now that you are um, a doctor. I speaking don't want of talking down. This. Speaking of talking down a peg. Let's continue to talk about propaganda uh, from yes. the peg. Polo Park. <laughs> so, the forks. <laughs> So we are, uh, before we get to covers, before we get to our guest, um, you know, here is an Epifat band that I think at some point people wondered if we would talk about them. I don't think we will ever really do an episode about this band because I truly have nothing to say. But the Mad Caddies recorded a cover of this song uh, as part of an album called Punk Rock Steady, which having done zero research, I can only assume is an album of punk covers done in this style. Is it just like the uh, sort of loosely rhyming, not alliteration, I don't know what it is. Is that what makes me think of, because Mod Cotties has Logwagon Energy as a band name to oh, me. Oh, yeah. I think it's the, I think it's like that ah uh, ah uh, sound. Mod Cotties. This is nice. I like this. Wow, the Mad Caddies sound has influences from broad-ranging genres including ska, punk rock, hardcore punk, reggae, Dixieland jazz, Latin music, polka, even cow punk, and sea shanties. Good lord. Oh man, speaking of uh, cow punk, um, the cover of Let's Talk More Rock is like a 1980s poster from the Calgary Stampede, a little taste of one of your many homes. Oh wow. So you do remember Um, one of the places I've lived. That's it, because you were there when we started talking. Both of these um, bands the have guys named Todd Todd in them. There's so many to- guys named Todd in bands that I know. Todd's remember. like the Canadian Chris, although I guess all these bands also have Chris's in them. Propaganda got a Chris. That's true. Mad Caddies definitely have a Chris, right? Beeline's never had a Chris, but they did have a Todd, and the, and he's mm. the best Todd, so shout out to him. Oh, damn. Todd supremacist. Um, I did want to play this because just to close out our, our Fat Mike conversation is Fat Mike appears at the end of this song just poking some fun at his at his old pals and propaganda. Really? Okay. And it comes in soon after this. I don't like this. You don't like it? No. I bet if I was like at a show... And this started happening, I'd be like, well, that's fucking awesome. But I'm like, bone sober. Not happy about it. Is this probably going to eat drink? I think so. Oh, there, hold on. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, do, are they- of course, this is, this is a reference to 
uh, you know, the, 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 the real novelty propaganda hit, Ska sucks. Okay, hold up. Before you hit play, I want to know, uh, are, does does propaganda like, drink? Are they a straight-edge band, or are they just vegan? No, they they, dr- they drink. I don't think it's, like, a big part of their... They're not, like, drunk punks, but I feel like they... Like, it's, there's some great live videos where, like, in the, like, beer holder on the mic stand, like, you know, Chris Hanna just has his, like, Nalgene or whatever. Like, I don't think they're big-time drinkers, mm, yeah, but, Nalgene, like... I can see that. I believe okay. they've had a, had a, had a, had a few brews in their time. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is this is Fat Mike calling back to the classic ska sucks. Wait for the end of this brew rocking. I mean, I love that. That's great. <laughs> he says the he, he says the C slur. Um, you it, mean it, Canucks? It truly, yeah. Yeah. Wow. That that hurt. I thought he was going to say Cox. Actually, I forgot about the word Canucks. But I guess <laughs> Fat Mike probably is one of those people who thinks saying cuck is like. Well, I, I mean, I get he's such a centrist. Oh, that's confusing, actually. Now that I'm I'm getting myself into a deep pit right now because he's such a centrist. He probably thinks. Like the word "cuck" was invented by Russian hackers, but at the same time, he literally probably is into like cuck play. <laughs> so it's kind of if, if there's a type of play, I think Fat Mike is into it. Um, that was really cool. Right? I, I, was, that's, a, that's a nice time. Do you think that Fat Mike, though? Before we I, look, he's sat here long enough. Let me ask this one question: Do you think Fat Mike and the Chris's and Todds of propaganda are, are still like on bad terms, or do you think if they run into each other at well, this I mean. Where does propaganda play shows and stuff? Do they play like punk rock bowling or all this kind of shit or or no? I don't. Or like Riot Fest, like backstage at Riot Fest, or is propaganda going to see Fat Mike? I think they played shows together. Propaganda played Fest a couple of years ago. Um, I I I read something recently where it's like they're back to like being fine. I think like look, it's like one of those things where like everyone mellows out. And I think I think the Rock Against Bush stuff, like I think that was real. Like I think that schism was like if you read interviews with them, it was like either they didn't want to talk about it or it was like, cause that shit, I think to everybody felt like life or death, but I think for propaganda, like this stuff has always felt like life or death, you know? And I do think though, that there's a sense of like everybody mellows. And I think they're all kind of, I think it's, they're all buds. fine. They're fine. Yeah. Although, you know, maybe the, I think the last interview I read where it was like, it's fine. We played a show together. Like we're all, we're friendly. Everything's good. That might've been before the weird Tegan and Sarah songs. So like, who <laughs> right. knows? Who I mean, knows I thought like Kanye and Drake like, were fine a year ago too. You know, I and know. It's just right? kind of like, Fuck. Maybe maybe this is going to ignite some real like maybe Chris Anna is going to dox Fat Mike's fucking mansion. I mean, if you, yeah. I hope that no one from Propaganda listened to this or just listened to the Sam channel, uh, but yeah, 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 you just like just hard pan it left and right. But even me, I'm like, look, I, like again, this is not this was a good song to talk about, even though we basically didn't talk about it that much in this era because you know this is like very oh yeah, we forgot to, so real shit. real quick about the song. So it's about like uh, the government or something. No, it's about corporations and oh, the government. Well, same diff, bro. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's uh, you know the song is about how um, you know corporations really like run um, most countries uh, these days, and why wasn't that an evergreen um, sentiment? Well, probably so, back when they wrote this, the brands weren't doing like Pride Month uh, logos and stuff. So that's kind of true. I wonder, I wonder if he feels different now, now that, that people like change their Twitter avatars. Nihilist Arby's and stuff too. Like they're going through some oh, shit. Oh, it's totally different. Yeah, totally, totally different. So I think that's the update, and uh, <laughs> and, and that's that's the essence of this song that I'm sure has like ten thousand footnotes that you could get into. Sam, it would be funny if this was intended to be funny, but instead it's just us. We get ca- so caught up in our own asses when we talk. We keep forgetting that we have guests here sitting the entire time for hours on end. I it's know. just kind of. I don't think we've ever done anything intentionally funny, anyway. <laughs> but exactly. But I mean, this this and and it's nice that he's finally just started sort of quietly chuckling in the background. Finally, he's finally, a biting giggle. his tongue for the last two hours. It's uh, been it's been painful. <laughs> right. I, I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> but what I mean, let's go ahead and introduce our guest this week. 
Well, of course, we could not talk about propaganda without inviting on uh, one half of Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. Greg, how's Hello. it going? Hello. It is wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I'm here. I'm here. We're, we're doing this. It's good times. So, I Greg, mean, there was so Greg, no other option. Greg, your, your show is kind of basically like a Blink-155, right? I mean, yeah. let's cut to the chase. That's yeah. what it is. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. It's, so we, I was thinking that talked. you need to pay it. Like the, all these podcasts that started after us should be paying us like protection, like we're the mob or something. You know. Like, <laughs> I, I, but do we just all owe money to like um, you know X Files files or Gilmore guys? Like who is who no? Because we're the ones the... who thought of you're you're the one who thought of taking Gilmore guys and then making it about tunes, and that is like <laughs> that's crazy. That innovative, changed the game. <laughs> innovative thinking. Yeah, we, I mean. My my discovery of you guys was like pretty simultaneous with when I discovered another couple song by song podcast. But like this is like the original, like to me. I mean, this is the, I'm just so, so thrilled to be here. I can't believe I'm even on the show with you guys right now. It's fantastic. Well, I, here's my real question. I mean, I'm just I'm just being a dick as usual. But my real question oh, is, I mean, I don't know how much of our show you've listened to, and it's okay. A lot. If, okay, okay. Then then I'd like to know. Are you more of a Sam or a Joe? Oh, and is your and your co-host like what's your dynamic on your show? Oh man, um, so I think I'm probably more of a Sam, and I think that Keith is more of a Joe. Um, and I'm not saying I'm not really. I think that you guys have like such a longer term relationship than Keith and I. Keith and I only met like on Twitter like a year and a half ago. And so we only have met in person one time ever. So our entire dynamic is solely on the internet. So that's like something that kind of has been strange for us is the fact that we don't really even know each other, but we make this intensely in-depth show together. So it's kind of a little bit of a different dynamic than a lot of other shows do song by songs where people have been friends for a long time and have actually hung out a lot in person. You know what I mean? So that's kind of like you that, that, I mean, that was our journey. We barely knew each other too. So it's kind of like you are living our lot. Like it's like a, a few years after you're, you're living the same loop and it's actually kind of scary. And I feel like it might be a curse that it's comes weird when you do it's, a song by song podcast. It's really weird. And it's like an obsession. As you guys know, you get caught in this, uh, like this obsessive cycle of making sure that you're ready for the next episode and things like that. And it's just really amazing how much it consumes and takes over so much of your free time to where it's like, well, I have these free hours. I got to work on the song, you know? So you have, I mean, this is what happened to us. Well, first of all, how many propagandi songs are there? So there's about 110, as far as I can tell. There may give or take a few more. There's 88 that are on full lengths as official songs because they have such a small discography, which is really the only reason I agreed to do the show in the first place is that the discography is so small. And then we, you know, brought in the quantity is job number one, quality is job number one. I'd rather be flag burning, compilation tracks, things like that. So then it kind of like expanded to be about another another 20 songs or so. Yeah, I guess maybe because the number is not in the name of your show. But do you have people constantly badgering you like, uh, what are you going to do when you run out of propaganda songs? When we run out of propaganda songs, the show is done. Um we, I have another you think show. think that, but it won't happen. <laughs> yeah, that's not you'll, good. You'll, you'll dream of that moment and it will never come for you. <laughs> people keep telling me, Greg, you got to do the strung out one next or something like that. So people tell me a lot, like which, which band I should move on to next. And I don't really know yet. And fortunately, we're only about halfway through. And this is so much work that um, when the time comes, I'm hoping that I can get a break because I think propaganda will do LP number eight and then we will come back. Hopefully we can have a break and then come back and do the eighth record uh, as kind of like a, a, you know, a series over a couple of months, you know. Hmm. If I could make a suggestion, if, if Keith really is more of the Josiah just get him to do all the work. Cause that's what made four years of blink 182 manageable for me is I didn't do anything. Mm, and yeah. it seems like you're not a true Sam because it sounds like you actually put effort into your podcast. Okay. So, so maybe Keith and I are both Joe's maybe, yeah. or maybe Keith is more, is more, cause I don't know about your behind the scenes dynamic. You know what I mean? Like Keith always on the I'm show. Quite cool. he, he, 
he embarrasses me so much on the show because he's always like, Greg does all the work. If it wasn't for Greg, the show wouldn't be here. And I'm like, dude, okay, like we're doing the show together. Like this is a, a project that we're doing together and you do as much as you possibly can. It's just that my schedule is so much different than yours that I have the ability to track people down and tie stuff in and like Yeah, work you're being manipulated by your boss is what's happening. <laughs> and that's what's yeah. happened to me too. <laughs> yeah, so it's really, it's really just a different dynamic um, of the way that our schedules and our lives are playing out. Um, and so Keith is always on the show like, oh, Greg does this and that. And I, I do a lot, but I do it because I love it. Not because like, I feel guilty that he's not doing X, Y, Z. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So Sam's the big, uh, prop prop head. Is there a name for the fans? Prop propaganda guy. I, that's a really great question. I feel like I should come up with one. I don't really know. I haven't ever heard one though. Yeah. You're the guys to do it. Yeah. Pro propaganda guys is, Pro is propaganda guys. Yeah. That's is, pretty is, good. Is, you know, the, the gen gendered part of it is not great, but like we yeah. can all, anyone can be a propaganda guy. Um, <laughs> but I, but I, I guess my, I don't think the band would be into it. Before <laughs> Sam gets into his like fucking nerdy, I'm going to take a nap while Sam asks you whatever he's about to ask you. But uh, my question <laughs> like, is. You're being really active, Josiah. I did not expect this, but I realized it was because you just wanted to sort of interrogate kind of dynamic and also assert um, song by song dominance. <laughs> exactly. It's awesome. It's awesome. Like, and I have nothing but respect for the show. I love the the fact that uh, that your show existed and that it gave me so many good ideas for how you can do something like this, but also the fact that when my show started getting longer, that I didn't care that it got longer. Do you know what I mean? Like you guys gave yeah. me a, a sort of blueprint that to yeah. show me that I really can do whatever I want on this show. And as long as I feel good about it, that's really all that matters. You know what I mean? Well, you don't even need to feel good about it, really. You just need to keep <laughs> posting it. <laughs> I, I want to feel good about it. I want to. Yeah. <laughs> Did but, you ever edit? Like, because your episodes are like two hours, our episodes, similar, similar problem slash advantage. Like, were you yeah. like thinking that you would do one kind of show and then it just spooled out? Yeah, totally. Like I thought the show, the, I shot, I thought the show was going to be a lot more like uh, the Alkaline Trio song by song podcast where the episodes are like 35 to 45 minutes long. I thought it was going to be just like that. But then what happens is you dig into propaganda lyrics and the lyrics alone are a 35 to 45 minute conversation just because of the vocab and the historical events and the people and places. Yeah. Totally. You have to dig into so many key terms within a propaganda episode that it's just a different kind of band than like Alkaline Trio. And so like I was finding so many more things that were keeping my attention going. And then I was just like, this is not, this is not going to stay an hour long show. I mean, if, if I follow a story and the story takes me in a certain direction and I've wound up reading 25 or 30 articles about an event that led to the creation of a single song, those are the things that I want to talk about. And I want to talk about my feelings in relation to those world events that led to the song being created. So that's why the show sort of blew up and became something that I wasn't expecting is because there's such a treasure trove of resources and rabbit holes that you can go down to for every single propaganda song. I mean, it's absolutely been insane how much we've uh, found in relation to the songs. Yeah, I don't know if that was our. I don't know if it's that there was too many pertinent <laughs> so facts much come to talk about. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> but what I was trying to get at earlier was like, so uh, we've had our friend Yasi on the pod a few times, and she loves to just absolutely uh bully the shit out of us about everything we say constantly and for some reason we keep inviting her back but i gotta say you know on a recent patreon episode she pronounced this band's name three different ways and we were both nice. too polite to bring it up you're saying propagandy i think i say propagandy because i don't yep. know and so my fr this is a two-part say propagandy my two-parter is this what is the actual pronunciation of the band how does the band say it and my second part is i love that it's a pun name but I'm a little bothered by the placement of the H because it isn't Gandhi like G H A N D I like is the H it feels like there's a typo in this uh portmanteau. <laughs> so the um no, Gandhi, Spooner, wait, is it a Spoonerism or a portmanteau? And fuck, I'm getting caught up on that again, too. Gandhi, the Indian lawyer, Mahatma Gandhi, is is uh, definitely spelled G-A-N-D-H-I. Okay. So it's it's pronounced the same way as the band does it, yeah. So it is spelled correctly. So maybe I'm I my, I, I must have spelled it wrong. Of many times when I worked for Exclaim, and had well, to write what's funny? Band. There's actually a bootleg seven inch uh, called "Reclaim the Streets," uh, and it's got a bunch of old songs on, like "Scott Sucks" and "Who'll Help Me Bake This Bread." But it was a bootleg from the '90s, and the cover is misprinted, and the 
the name of the band is actually misspelled on the cover of the bootleg. So you can like go and look at that on Discogs and stuff. It's pretty funny. I've got a copy of it right over there. <laughs> and then the band says it Gandhi, Propagandi. So if you listen to anybody in the band say it, they'll say Propagandi. And I'm not exactly sure why they say it. I think that it's a, you know, a, a recreation of the word propaganda. So I think that they just switched right. the very end of it. So instead of like propaganda, uh, that's pretty right. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, propaganda makes sense if you think about propagandy. And so I don't really know if it was necessarily, uh, I think it was actually just a play on propaganda as like the primary uh, wordplay. And I don't really think that, Gandhi, the person, had a whole heck of a lot to do with that. That's just my theory, like going in on about why they would say a propaganda and not propaganda. I mean, I think I can, the best wordplay is like jazz. You just kind of start talking and improvise the rest yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah. And what's so funny is talking like Su Lin and, you know, Su Lin's from Florida and saying Su Lin's like, oh, I'm in propaganda. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. You're from the South and you're saying propaganda. And and then Sue Lynn's like, yeah, it's because the band says it that way. That's how I say it. And we've talked about that on the show a whole bunch of times. And it always gets a big kick out of uh, guests coming on saying how they say it and explaining why they say it the way they say it. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all fine. It's all fine here. <laughs> I, I feel like it's, it's a situation where who is like the king you know, the Spanish king, and that's why they say Ibiza, because the king had a speech impediment or whatever. And it really oh, is Ibiza, but it's just that everyone had to pretend to have a speech impediment in order to not upset the king. Is this a situation where we are all kind of doing an impression of the super Canadian accents that at least the Canadian members of Propagandi have? Because they, like, there is no one more Canadian in this world, at least like then Todd in particular, but like mm-hmm. Chris Hanna also, the man has a, has a, has an accent. Oh yeah. And, and, and Jord too. I mean, I actually think that Jord yeah. is, is the most intense of the accents of the three. Chris is funny because he, he talks about this on his Patreon, but he spent a year living in Australia when his father was in the military when he was a kid. And so he went to Australia talking like a five-year-old Canadian. And then the bunch of the kids made fun of him. So then he switched over to talking like an Australian kid, like within one day. But uh, yeah, it's really funny. And I, I learned so much of my, my impressions of Canada were so skewed growing up because everything I knew about Canada was um, like the Quebec Nordiques and propaganda. So it was a really strange way of understanding the country um, because I was so skewed on what I thought the country was like because it was like the major French Canadian hockey team that I was following and then this radical uh, Canadian band from the prairie. So I thought that Canada was totally different than it actually is. So, I mean, what do you think Canada actually is then? Uh, well, I mean, I, I lived there for a couple years in my 20s. I did my master's at the University of Saskatchewan. And, um, you know, I, I just was like really, I, I didn't know anything really. And so I went in and learned tons and tons of stuff about um, you know, like living in the prairies and the climate and the culture of it. And everybody was so polite and so kind to me and welcoming. And I just really enjoyed my time there. And I was like, oh, does everybody know propaganda? And everybody's like, no, who the hell are you talking about? <laughs> so I moved there thinking that everybody was going to be like a massive propaganda fan. And then I was like walking around the streets like, there's nobody. I'm so alone. <laughs> so it was kind of funny, you know. Were they at least big time Nordiques fans? I, I, no, I don't think so. I don't think they were that either. I you know. Were very alone out in Saskatchewan. I, I totally was. Yeah. Oh, and I just looked up that king and it's definitely King Ferdinand of Spain. Mm, that's a big king. That's a, that's an important, that's like a top five king. for sure. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So Greg, who are your top five Kings? Um, that's, um, <laughs> Holy <laughs> smokes. I have no idea. I'm not really much of a, much of a, a, a an king. idealizer of Kings. Yeah, that's, that's true. Okay. No, that's, the yeah, test. that's the propaganda <laughs> test. <laughs> yeah. You can still continue to host a propaganda <laughs> podcast. You yes, saying thank it you. so much as propaganda and also stare. Cause I've had like, I then had it like I have a, some of my notes open and stuff. The word has lost all meaning to me. I love now. it when that like, happens. Total sort of, um, you know, ego death as regards at least saying propaganda. Yeah, I love when that happens. Like if you say refrigerator like 10 times, like what the hell am I even saying? <laughs> it's probably got it's really the refrigerator of uh, highly political <laughs> punk bands. This week we are talking about nation states, which is mm-hmm. kind of, in my opinion, like the hit of this era of the band. And this is something that you guys haven't done yet, right? Right. So how Whoa, much shit. 
I know. So how much of an opinion are you allowed to offer without sort of spoiling your own show? Oh, I mean, I'm not worried about that at all. Um, <laughs> no matter so, what, no matter what I say here will be like the tip of the iceberg for what is like included in the episode whenever I wind up getting around to it. Um, so I'm totally not worried about it at all. Is this the big song for you? Because obviously for us doing Blink-155, everything was leading up to Damn It. Mm-hmm. Do you have a sense of like, is everything leading up to... You know, you know, I don't really know if Propaganda, obviously, because they don't have like a radio hit. Like, what is the sort of thing that you're going to end the show with? Do you know? Can you say? Is it, what are, is what it are a song end on? Yeah. We're going to end on the song Unscripted Moment from Failed States because right, it's the name of the sense. show. Okay. But um, we're, we do have some material recorded for the Nation States episode, but it's one of those songs that is we procrastinate it week after week. You know what I mean? Like, there are certain songs that I just do not enjoy planning for like Mataka, Marisa Kun, Rasa Khan, mm-hmm. uh, Oka Everywhere, um, Dear Coach's Corner. Like some of them are just such profoundly challenging songs to think about and to plan for that I am not excited to do them at all. So this is one of those episodes that like I I I I'm I really want it to be right. And so what that means is I tend to procrastinate it a whole lot, much to the chagrin of my very gracious guests who already have interviews recorded for that episode and that I have not released yet. Um, So, you know, it's one of those things where it's just one of that songs like, oh, God, I don't want to do that one next week. It's just going to be too hard. So that's kind of where we are with it at the moment. But yeah, it'll be probably it'll be before the end of the 70s episodes for sure it'll either be in the 60s or the 70s because we've got some stuff ready for it we definitely used to get that way about like the big blank hits yeah point where i just was not present for the all the small things episode so the biggest sam's never talked about it i've never (laughs) talked in public about all the small things (laughs) because i did that episode alone oh god like not with a guest like or a guest it was a dark night of the soul for sure so maybe you should you know you could just do um do nation take take the biggest is this the band do it is this the band's all the small things well, I don't know. That's my question, Greg. What do you think? Because you know, this, to me, as, the sand sits in so many different eras, right? And like, as far yeah, as far as uh, fan um, impact, people mm-hmm. who sit, people who come on the show and say that they are declare themselves propaganda lifelong super fans, this is the song that gets mentioned eighty to ninety percent of the time as being the orienting gateway into this band. So this is as far as I can tell the song that got the people who have been lifelong fans, um, mostly into the band. So this is the one, you know what I mean? Like Frank Turner said it, uh, tons of other guests said it like, this is the one that got them into the song. So yeah, I definitely think it is. Do you feel like in those conversations that you're having, that there are people who sort of come into propaganda in two different directions? Because Josiah in the past and probably in this episode has said, <laughs> like, what do you you think propaganda kind of sounds like tool, right? That's that like, an- I haven't really listened to them, but that's just the vibe <laughs> I get. It seems like it's like pop punk tool eventually. Like people, <laughs> oh I, man, I used to like very lazily write about them for Exclaim Magazine just when I'd have to like regurgitate a press release in 30 seconds. And I remember describing it as melodic pop punk because just what I always thought it was, just using context clues, and people would be like, um, actually, it's tech, uh, prog metal, political. And I'm like, so in my mind, it's like tool <laughs> for sure. It's like that snowboarder. Is, that's tool. amazing. That's does amazing. That, does it upset you, Greg, the way it upsets me when he says it? Uh, it it's definitely jarring. It's a jarring <laughs> description, I would say for sure, but I don't really necessarily get mad, but I would definitely <laughs> say that it's incorrect i would say that it's objectively incorrect <laughs> that, that's pretty good do you do you <laughs> that makes me want to steer up? into it even more i know to be like honest. I, you know what this is done right it's fuel and fire it's definitely 100 percent fact for me now. this is total fact it's going in the <laughs> dictionary for all time so i felt like growing up there was people who are a couple of years older than me who got into this band around this time and were mm-hmm. really into the sort of like fat era songs. And the reason we're doing this song is because this is Epithad Month for us. This appears on Survival of the Fattest. All the songs we're doing are from compilations. And so that's yeah. how we've ended up on Nation States. Otherwise, we probably would have done something based on my interest from like today's empires yeah. po- or then post today's empires. Do you feel like... Uh, that's the experience of a lot of people that you talk to. Was that your experience of like, they're kind of the skate punk propaganda fans and then the 
pop punk tool era propaganda fans. Yes. I do think that there is a very distinct dividing line. I mean, if you look at that, uh, the guy who does the punk rock vinyl Instagram page recently did that best of propaganda, uh, rankings, like he did the bracket system and Mm -hmm. how to clean everything totally destroyed that entire poll which to me doesn't make any sense. It's because objectively me, insane. Yeah, it's objectively insane. Lock mm. them up. Um, to me, this is an era of the band which is extremely special. And I was talking to somebody the other day who listens to the podcast, and they were like, "We did our what episode did we do? The uh, refusing to be a man episode." And he wrote to me and said, this is not even close to being my favorite propaganda record, but I think it might be the most important propaganda record because just of the amount of ideas, the diversity and the range of information that's included in the record as a whole um, with the gay positive, animal friendly, uh, pro-feminist, anti-fascist written right there on the cover art. The lyrics on the record are printed right there on the back of the LP, so you can read it before you even take it out of a store or whatever. And just the the sheer uh, impact of the ideas on the record are so deep that it changed so many people's lives that I think this might be the most important propaganda record that there is because it was just so far out in front of so many other bands as far as ideas and information goes and how you, people can change the way they see the world and profoundly change their own behavior to make the world sort of a better place uh, as we careen into a very unknown future. Well, it's interesting to think about it that way because now the band's contemporaries are more likely to share their perspectives. I think their fan base probably does. But at that time, they were like a pop punk fat band. Like they sounded like no effects. And yeah. so to be that band and to be that explicit about your politics, yeah. I, I think it's a really good point, was like tremendously valuable. Yeah. And the band was extremely confrontational in this period as well. If you go see Propaganda live now, it's like, hey, right on, you know, thanks for coming. And then they go out there and they play their songs. But if you go back and listen to the song, uh, live sets from the mid nineties. There's a really famous one at Gilman street in 1995, where Chris essentially just yells at the crowd for about 30 or 40 minutes. Um, so it's like a one minute song and then five minutes of Chris yelling at the crowd and then the crowd yelling back. And it's so amazing to think about the way that they were putting ideas in front of people's faces, uh, unapologetically in public and essentially inviting themselves to get their asses beat like after shows and stuff because they were just so vocal about the shortcomings of the behavior that they saw in the crowd. And, you know, that's just something that stands out to me so much about this era is just how brave a lot of this music is and how it's quite, it's making people question themselves in so many ways. And that's just, you know, something about this record that's so special is like how brave the lyrics are, how confrontational and in your face it is and how, how much it stands out in regard for the time and place in which they were performing all these songs in front of these crowds that were not really had been exposed to these ideas before and thus got very defensive when they were called out in the audience. And so it's basically the band calling people on their shit and then the band getting really like antsy and defensive and yelling back at them. So then it turns into a spiral of, of really problematic environment within a club. You know what I mean? And did you ever see the band in this era? Cause I don't think nope. I saw them yet yeah, until they started touring again around Potemkin city limits. Maybe yeah. it was like when they finally kind of came back to Toronto after a long time. Like, so for you, you, you missed out. That's just like a sort of uh, a, a, a YouTube memory that you get to have. Correct. Yeah. The first time I heard propaganda, I, my, my band that sound, we were trying to sound like blink Learning Two dude ranch. Um, funnily enough. Hell yes. And I, we were at this guy's house who was recording our band and he had a little studio in his basement and how to clean everything was sitting on the coffee table in his living room. And I either stole it or borrowed it. I don't remember which. And I've actually emailed him since. And I said, Hey, did I steal a propaganda city from you? He's like, I don't freaking know. And I don't care. Um, <laughs> so my first exposure to propaganda was while I was in a band getting the CD from the person's house who was recording us. And it was, uh, so my first exposure to the band was anti-manifesto, not nation states. I mean, that's, that's a pretty good introduction though. Oh my God. Unbelievable. Yeah. So so how do you feel about nation states at this point as someone who has spent, what do you, which episode are you guys at now? I mean, like, you know, we're almost about to hit 60. We've done it. We've done 58 and then we've done I think we've done like eight or nine bonus episodes as well. 
So with that, like, very, very sort of, like, deep living in this band's catalog, yeah. how do you feel about Nation States now versus, like, maybe how you felt when the when your podcast started? Has your, like, perception of this song changed at all? And do you listen to this song also, like, or any propaganda when not doing the pod, which is another thing that people used to ask me and Josiah all the time? <laughs> yeah, I listen to propaganda all the time. Um, it's, it's an absolute obsession, and that's one of the reasons why I think I'll be excited for the show to end someday is that I will be able to purposefully examine more music again and like take in a more wide range of music right now I'm pretty limited in what I take in unless something falls right in front of my face just because I've got such a one track mind as far as this project goes but like this song I never skip it I listen to it every single time I don't think I've ever skipped this song whenever it comes on whenever I'm listening to the record and I've listened to less talk more rock more times this year than easily in the past decade because of the podcast, but also because of the 25th anniversary, uh, because of the new vinyl editions that came out and because of the podcast. Um, and I've gained a lot of new appreciations for this record because of the impact and the importance of this, because we did episode one and I was like, this is my sixth favorite propaganda record out of seven. And Damn. That, yeah, that what raised is your the least lo- favorite propaganda record. Oh, how to clean everything. No questions right. okay, asked. Yeah. 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 Um, it's like not even close to like how to clean everything is so much farther down below. Less talk, more rock. It doesn't even come close to, to this record for me. But I always, but I said very publicly in our first episode that this is my sixth favorite record and it raised a lot of hackles and it drew some suspicion uh, among the listeners who checked out that first episode that, um, you know, that we weren't going to give it a fair shake. But what we've done is we make sure that we hit every song as hard as we possibly can, no matter what. I mean, we did a three and a half hour episode on Oka Everywhere, which is like a totally forgotten song. Like the band doesn't really play it anymore. And it's about like, you know, the 1990s uh, standoff at Kanazatake and Oka Quebec. And it's just not a song that's on a lot of people's radars anymore. And we did a three and a half hour episode on it. So yeah. I think we've assuaged. Respect. Yeah, thank you. I think we've assuaged a little bit of skepticism about the show by giving every single song a 100% effort, no matter what. So, but I never skip Nation States. It's one of the best songs. Um, it's one of the best songs ever in punk. I mean, seriously, it is. It's. It, it has a lot going on and I look forward to like, we get to do the like covers portion of this show where like people who listen to it will cover it. So that's happening. We have sweet, all of the listeners also waiting to perform their covers. Um, <laughs> yeah, amazing. As, <laughs> yeah. So in a second, we're going to ask you to stop speaking again. Just <laughs> yeah, you have to be quiet so they can quietly. all do, do their little performances. <laughs> um, you said you banked some interviews already for this episode. Is there any like tease you can offer uh, who people Sam's, might Sam's trying to invite nation? himself on? I'm not trying to invite, myself on um but i do have lots of propaganda opinions um but for for people who listen to your show who are like "Ooh, the nation states episode okay it's coming maybe it's in the 70s this is a big song this is going to be a big episode for you uh is is there any people you could tease anything about that episode that you can sort of whet the people's appetite with well i'm trying to get somebody to do a cover of it so i think i'm getting i think somebody's doing a really awesome like country rendition of the song so i think i'm getting like a sort of country and western style cover done for it um i've got a couple of interviews i've got uh jonah bear from the band united nations came on to talk about it uh with he's in that band with jeff rickley yeah and jonah wrote for um alternative press for a long time and is absolutely wonderful and then Who Vanessa Bayer's uh, brother. I'll Absolutely. Yeah. Vanessa Bayer from Saturday Night Live, her brother. Uh, and then I also got Mike DeMonte, who do, who's a huge Blink-182 fan as well. But he writes books about like, you know, pop punk and UFOs. And he's a music journalist. So he's coming on. And then I think it's actually going to be maybe one of the longest episodes we've ever done, if not the longest, because I have two more guests that are still thinking about coming on as well. So it might be our first Four guest episode, which is truly bonkers. And uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll be totally exhausted by the time I get done editing it. You got to get Gandhi yeah. on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
it, I, yeah, great. there's got to be a Gandhi descended you could get on, you know? Yeah. I mean, I actually do have a friend who's a professor in Michigan and her last name is Gandhi. Maybe I should have her come on just for no freaking reason and be like, hi, do you want to, you know, Dr. Gandhi, welcome That's to the show. Right. Uh, I'm going to yes. make you listen to propaganda for the first time ever right now live. And then you're going to tell me what you think about it. Yeah, See, that's, that's, a good idea. that's the Blink-155 way. I mean, keep yeah. following this path. It's going to ruin your See, life. But this is good, good stuff. This, you just go down these rabbit holes, no matter how far it takes you, you just take it all the way to the natural conclusion and then you're done. We did um, Blink's cover of Billy Idol's Dancing With Myself. And in order to say that the episode featured Billy Idol, uh, <laughs> Josiah interviewed a Billy Idol impersonator. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that was really cool. Oh. And I think there was another time where you just got a, was it just where we got a guy whose name was Scott Rayner? No. Well, uh, well. Didn't we do one where we just got someone with the same name? Or was that so just they, got these the were kind of like, Sutherland? these were ethical dilemmas because the Billy Idol one, I put an asterisk beside his name. No, did you put his name episode. in quotes? Maybe? Um, yeah, there was something like that, but people still thought yeah. it was actually him and they were congratulating me. So that was upsetting. We did get the real Scott Rayner via email. Oh my uh, God. But his don't an- even get me started on Scott Rayner. But his like, answers, don't even get me his answers sucked and I felt guilty. So I, I felt like it wasn't enough to put featuring Scott Rayner in the title, just having like his shitty email answers. So then I did yeah. also call someone in the phone book named Scott Rayner. Who okay, that was <laughs> hung yeah. up on me. But I mean, <laughs> those two half truths I think made it true that we featured Scott Rayner. On the yeah, episode. I did see Blink One Eighty Two with Scott Rayner live. That was pretty awesome. Fuck, when and where? February twenty fourth, nineteen ninety eight, St. Louis, Missouri, Mississippi Nights. The Aquabats, featuring one Travis Barker, opened the show. Oh, wow. Whoa. We just did yeah. an Aquabats episode, too, as part nice. of a, a very intense Travis month. You've had the good fortune, speaking of four interviews for your Nation States episode, you've had the good fortune of, I believe, having all of the members of Propagandi join you, whereas we have only had Mark Hoppus diss us and pretend that he was never on our show. Yeah. Uh, is that correct? And 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 mm-hmm. what was that experience like for for you it's an honor the fact Mm. that the members of the band care about the show participate in the show are responsive and engaged with the with the show is just beyond the greatest compliment we could have ever gotten um chris came on the show right away episode number six and It it was great. Yeah, because it was right away. And I was just like, wow, this really does set the stage for what we can accomplish with this show. Um, And then Sue Lynn and Beave have both been on us. I think Sue Lynn's been on three times now. Beave's been on twice. Um, Todd came on once. And the, the second guest on Todd's episode was his brother. So Todd and his brother were on the show together. And that was really cool. Uh, And then Jord came on and talked to me for like an hour and a half for episode 51. And that was awesome. I did write a really long letter to John K. Sampson and he very politely declined, um, which is fine because John K. Sampson has given plenty of interviews about how he feels about propaganda. And I am not trying to make his life worse because I respect his, his body of work so much. So John K. Sampson is a no, um, which is fine. I'm totally cool with that. Now I'm gonna go ahead and say fuck John K. Yeah. Samson. More no! like you can't you can't say it, but we can. More like <laughs> John not okay, Samson. <laughs> <laughs> that was a funny one. That was good. And but yeah, it's really cool. Um, because the band has been really supportive of it, and we're we're so lucky because think about how if if, so, if you have a body of work and then like some people who come in and they're like oh man, this is just so sick. This riff is rad. And then like, they're like, okay, that's like the, that's, that's done. And then you just kind of blow off all these specific things behind it. But the fact that we go as hard as we do on the different songs, the band kind of saw that right away that we were not joking and that this wasn't a joke to us and that we took it really seriously. And they were like, whoa, okay, you guys are pretty cool. Go for it. Let us know if you have any questions. So that was really cool. Josiah, maybe that was our mistake. <laughs> yeah, I think I think me me being involved was the mistake. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, don't have me on the show because I, I want to talk more about how in my mind they sound like Tool, but I don't think that <laughs> I don't think they'll like that. Um, but, but if people do want to listen, what's what's the deal? I mean, where do they check you out? What what day does it come out? And you know, all the other spiel stuff. So we're having we're having some scheduling logistics right now. Uh, my co-host Keith has been traveling a lot this summer, so we've been a little less frequent this summer than in the past. 
podcast. Um, but for the first entire year of the episode, we were every single Wednesday. And then sometimes I would do a Saturday bonus episode. So there was like 10 weeks of the year where we had two episodes in one week. So we hit it really, really hard coming out of the gate for the first year to just really show the consistency that we felt that the listeners of the show deserved because we wanted to make sure that people knew we cared about it and that we weren't just going to like keep them hanging. Um, so we, we do it on Wednesdays. And right now we're trying to get back on that schedule, but we're both teachers. So the school year is ramping back up here in this very, very uncertain near future that we're all living in. And so things are very up in the air as far as scheduling goes, but Wednesdays uh, is when we, we shoot for and it's on Spotify and Apple and Google and all that stuff. And it's just called unscripted moments, a podcast about propaganda. So it pops right up um, in the app. So it's pretty, pretty fun. Cool. Well, awesome. before we uh, put your gag back in, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say. Cool. Otherwise, it's been great having you here. Thanks for coming on. I'm just so delighted. And you guys really uh, you know, gave me a model uh, with your, with your Blink-155 show to show what is possible with shows like this, how you really can just take it and come up with so many different angles and ways of looking at music and art and just pushing it as far as you can. So I'm just super grateful that shows like yours exist because it gave me a blueprint in my brain for be like, wow, I really can do whatever I want. And as long as I feel good about doing these songs justice, like I can push it as far as it can possibly go. And you guys kind of put, put those kinds of ideas in my head and made me believe that I could actually do it. Hell yeah, man. That is very kind of you. And uh, I'm sorry for all the hours that you've now subsequently lost. <laughs> It's all good. It's a real pleasure, but thank you so much for having me and letting me come on a nerd out about my nerdiest project that I've ever nerded on in my whole life. Hell yeah, man. Greg, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. I know I was complaining that uh, the song is too verbose, so can you just explain this next bit in as few words as possible? And I'm going to count them. Well, I'm not going to count Well, maybe I'll count them. I'll see if I can count okay. them. Okay, that's okay, two. Okay. So that's three, four. Covers from Patreon... Mm-hmm. Made in weekend. Okay, you're at eleven. Because you said okay so many times. <laughs> if you mm-hmm. five dollars. <laughs> okay, fifteen. Also, I think I'm bad at counting too, but it's less than 20. Bonus episodes. Mm-hmm. Way more. <laughs> wow. Way. All songs, Bandcamp, Monday. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> that was definitely less than 30 words, I think. So. Yeah, that's barely, brevity. That was barely even a propaganda song title. Uh, brevity boys. <laughs> that was good. That was really good. Uh, Thanks, man. So let's get into it, baby. Up uh, first, we got the baggage handlers. The nation state I'm in. There's some uh, artwork here. Ooh, featuring Georgia. I love to see that. Besides Green Day, this is the first song of the new pod that I had history with slash truly cared about, and it was frustratingly difficult to tame. I was close to giving up a few times, but thanks to Georgia and Tex coming through with some lovely vocals and encouragement from my favorite nation, I'm happy to hit submit and finally sleep. Bless y'all. Oh, yeah. Well, bless y'all, too, and here we go. Bless y'all. Nice. Now I love the song. See, the, the verbiosity works very well in a tweet context. It's so good in this class for yes. Oh, I heard text. There's text. I can't believe I have to worry about this kind of shit. What a 
Oh my god! Incredible. Okay, that was lovely. I do, I do have to say, like, the, and the way, like, hearing like two people singing that song together, you know, nation pals of ours, like, really reminds me of like, it is very fun at a propaganda show to yell, "What a stupid world!" Oh my god, that's a nice. I thing can only do. imagine, right? <laughs> Just yeah, arm in um. arm. <laughs> <laughs> I think I like the nation state I'm in by uh, the baggage handlers the best so far in terms of versions of this song. I'm next is the fake plodes with the nation state song going into joke territory again this week, but I couldn't help but play off the similarity of the intro riff to that of another Canadian pop punk classic recorded on vacation in Regina at my aunt's place with a rented guitar on my phone. So I think this kid rented a guitar to do this. I mean, that's commitment right there. Um, here we go. Amazing. Kiddo, can I worry about this shit? What a beautiful, stupid world. Absolutely no regard for principle. What a stupid world. We're born, then we're hired and disposed of. Everybody knows where that job will end. The smile of the CEO lets you know environment is gonna go. You can bet us will be set to ensure the benefit of free work set in law by the government death squads. They own us, they make us, they consume us in the end. Can't believe, won't agree, to live in such a stupid world. Getting the most out of that rental. Holy fuck, yeah, like, damn, like, you're really making that shit work. Okay, what is... That's like a Sum 41 song, right? Yeah, that was the reference to this. There was the Sum 41 riff there. The Hell, isn't it called the Hell song? Yeah, exactly. That's So we got to do some more Sum 41. That was fucking awesome. Yeah. This is like a hard song. Like, I guess like it's interesting, like really maybe somewhat normal, I guess, chord structure, but this is like such a linear song, no chorus. I'm sure there's no MIDI files of it, which has always been like my trick covering songs. Do they hate, are like, they against choruses? Are choruses like a a, a tool of the state? A, a tool of the state, yeah. A tool, <laughs> tool of a uh, tool of CEOs and corporations. Um, Todd Killings with Nation State. There we go. Mm. I have a feeling mm-hmm. we'll see that pun again. Um, and Todd said, "Sorry, I had a little bit of a bevy uh, burp there that I tried to." Do quietly and politely, and now I'm just blowing it up completely. You're, yeah, and you're drawing a lot of attention to yourself. Yeah. Todd says, unfortunately, got a little too excited and a little too drunk. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> I love the lyrics when other people sing them. We should almost do covers first. Not a crazy idea. But then I would just be all giddy and high the whole time. (laughs) Yeah, that was sick. Oh my god. I don't I have no like I have no idea what that sounded like except just Todd Killings, which is just like that's it. Like, yeah, Todd Killings of, exists. Yeah, the best on his own. basement vibes. So sick. Best basement. Okay, I'm next. Tender Hell. Here's an acapella version. We're starting a little bit into the track. Let's go. Falling baby, our heads back in the barcodes of these me. Colonials, while a farmer, Nama, 
Since the nation state now plays fundraiser for our new brand of power, concentrate, try again, but now we're confused. What is class war? Is this class war? Yes, this is class war. And I'm just a kid. I can't believe that I gotta worry about this kind of shit. <laughs> I, ah, I'm speechless from that. That is unbelievable. <laughs> That's the definitive version of the song now, clearly. Yeah, they're all covers of that. That's unbelievable. I mean, would I like to see it put over top of the uh, Lonely Island, Imogen Heap, the OC parody? <laughs> yeah. it's yes. Pre- that one's pretty good. <laughs> Gosh, would I like to hear... They shot the other one, and then I, I think he shot him. <laughs> would I like to hear this version of the song sampled by Jason Derulo, a la Imogen Heap? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, but honestly, that that was not just merely Imogen Heap. It was beautiful, perfect. No, that was fucking sick. high art composition. Absolutely perfect. Okay, so and so oothing, so and so othing, clearly soothing with a cover of it. Uh, and the, they've sent a message that says, "Hope your pod is going well." Thank you so much. I mean, I think it's going well. Oh, pretty well. I'm a little, yeah. I'm a little nervous about. Uh, Getting stabbed by a, I feel a like forty-year-old Canadian pop punk fan is going to stab me. I'm worried. Me. Yeah, you're by me. Um, yeah, I'm worried that the band is going to listen, and I have not demystified. Like, despite being like casually, like you know, like like being able to like tweet back and forth with Chris Hanna, like I have not. Like, I still think that they are. They are intimidatingly cool and great to me, and so the idea of them listening to this is. Oh, tough you're scared for- that they're going to hear you admitting that you work for Universal. Is that what it is, or? Yeah, or even just like that. I, I you know, I, you know that I had to work through. That you're friends company. with me. Is that what it is? That's Have what I'm I worried about. That instead of instead of simply, um, you know, leaving the pod the minute you expressed any sort of anti-propaganda sentiment. Um, you know that I'm showing weakness. <laughs> I was speaking out against propaganda. Yeah. If you guys, are, I wasn't talking about your band. I, I was thinking, <laughs> oh, oh, my bad. I just saw this movie. They live. <laughs> okay, who is soothing? Because they're like the most delightful folk pop rock act. Like, I need to know more about soothing because it's just constant delightment at I'm every turn. Also, we didn't talk about how the lyrics of the song feature the phrase "I'm, just, I'm a kid. just a kid." <laughs> oh. I think it's an homage. Oh my god. Come on. And we gotta stop it right there. But the, That's I mean, not legal. That's not legal. Monday on we the, should make this clear. Yeah. Everyone is welcome to cover the songs, but you can't do anything criminal. <laughs> that was fucking crazy. That was so good. I hate it. It was yeah, that really I was offended by how good that was. I know. And, and like I said, that I didn't. the main thing I didn't like was how many lyrics were packed into it. But now it turns out I love the lyrics. And I think I love propaganda. I just needed to hear these <laughs> Yeah, there we so. go. We, I knew we'd get to you eventually. Bogging up next. Thanks to Matt from DRMC for the bass. Let's go. Bogging. Mm. Propagandi have a song about how Twinkle Hemo sucks, or do they have an opinion on that? Or? They haven't weighed in on the record on Twinkle Hemo. Maybe they're secret closet twinklers. 
seems like something seems like a phrase that shouldn't be uttered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful! This is nice! Wow! Oh my God. And you know what? I mean, obviously the twinkling was delightful. The vocals were perfect. Everything was perfect. Matt from DRMC, I know this is a big week for you because you love you love Epifat stuff and you especially love Propagandi. But then to show up in that context, that's sick. That's some that's some depth right there to be doing that. Totally. That, that was fucking awesome though. I'm I'm interested because like I feel like things might get noodly again here. I know. So Fish Tricks is usually a noodler and Shrews Robinson is kind of the uh the everyman. He, I mean, shoes is everywhere all the time, just doing perfect things. And also, we don't talk about it enough. Every Tuesday is Shoes Day on our Twitch. Shoes talks about mm-hmm. the covers that he did. And also, we have a Twitch, and we got to do another stream one of these days, I think. Uh, Maybe we'll do a back to school event. I feel like we probably did that last year. Yeah, I think we did. Now, oh. that, now that the pandemic is back, uh, let's do it. Well, we are doing a, uh, I guess we can say right now that next month's theme mm. is going to be back to school. Kind of, That's right. we're still working out exactly what that means, but it's going to be sort of the foundational back to school uh, month on the podcast. Five star binders. Mm-hmm. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to put up. Uh, I'm going to get those little shelves for your locker. You know. Do you ever have? I, do you ever still have stress dreams that you've showed up to school and like your courses are all in the wrong order and you don't know where to go and you can't like? I still have those every few every few years or every no, few months. As an I don't adult. know. I don't know. I don't have like sc- like anything that specific. As stress- my stress dreams are just all of my teeth fall out. That's it. Oh, cool! It, it never gets more specific than that. <laughs> uh, so this is Fish Tricks and Shoes Robinson. Here's what Shoes says: Fish Tricks was actually the first person from the Nation I ever collabed with. He reached out to me at the end of the old pod, and the split EP of Blink covers that we did together is still one of the things I'm proudest of. So doing this cover together in the midst of collab season feels like things coming full circle for me. It honestly makes me kind of emotional thinking about how far we've all come since then and how lucky I feel to be friends and collaborators with so many wonderful people. I mean, that's just delightful. That's just, that's beautiful. Okay, here we go. Fish tricks and shoes. This is the romance of a nation state. Now place my brazen for a new band that we're concentrating. Try again, but now we're confused. What is class war? Is this class war? Yes, this is class war. And I'm just a kid. I'm just a kid. I can't I gotta worry about this kind of shit. What a stupid world. of like post twinkle which is interesting I, yeah it's cool to have those back-to-back two collabs two twinklers but the, kind of this one was a little bit more i don't know there was more, a little bit more shoes in there as well as the twinkles yeah totally post twinkle sounds like a genre designation i mean all of it sounds completely incomprehensible to anyone who hasn't listened to this podcast for the last however many years you know it's like what when i just said is insane. These, when you post these tracks you will also be that's true. Post I mean, I don't think that's ca- see how little when you know Caleb about your empire. Tracks, Caleb, is, <laughs> Caleb, is, Caleb, Caleb, thank you for posting Twinkle. Uh, Carly Marks, and we thought pro states were a bad idea. Here we go. Publicly subsidized and privately profitable. Uh, you know what they say, folks? They own cum, they produce cum, consume cum. Can you fucking believe what a stupid world? There you go. So they Thank made it about cum. Thank you. Finally. Now Finally. it all makes sense. It all makes Finally, sense. Finally, a propaganda for everyone. <laughs> Baby Tyler's back plugged in. Let's hear what Baby Tyler's oh. back, back on the old uh, electricity. Well, you know where that comes from, the government. So you're a hypocrite. Here we go. He's 
back, baby. He is back. The do 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 like the the little like kind of like keyboard trill going into the next part. Oh my god, yeah, that was, was great. So sick. Yeah, I was like, I thought that I wasn't going to be ready for Baby Tyler to go electric again, but I was more than ready. I was bopping along to that. I do wish he had saying, "I'm just a baby" instead of "I'm just a kid." That would have been cool. But... <laughs> All right, should uh, offer up some notes. You know. <laughs> All right, another uh, return from Drill Rod. This is of course the Rocks How, who is constantly going on about some kind of uh, like geology based environmentalist stuff. So this is called environmental environmental restraints and OPEC nation states. Back from the field with a message: environmental restraints are about to go. They better or we're leaving. Um, and thanks Mika Mika for the help this week. So I don't know what any of that means. I don't. I assume you don't. But here we go. But what about the environment? You don't want to know. <laughs> Was there a little blink reference at the end there? Yeah, that had to be. In, you know, I love this. This is a real deep propaganda reference that just sounds a lot like blink. That was fucking awesome. Yeah, that was so cute and great work, uh, Mika Mika, as well. That was that was great. Okay, DRMC did submit his own cover, so we'll see. I mean, I'm so curious to. He, usually, he's like referencing propaganda while covering, you know, comeback kid or whatever. So. I'm wondering, do you think he went straight up with it, or do you think he referenced something else? Do you think he referenced uh, neoclassical cosmiche music to do like that's yeah, sort what of I'm thinking? Yeah, yeah. to be like klezmer <laughs> and then and then and then propaganda. It's gonna sound like Can landed. Uh, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Whoa! Is it the Mad Caddies version? No, that's like the spider web. Yeah, totally. But you're untouchable. Focus a moment, not in approval. Bury our heads in the barcodes of these neo colonials. There's a lot going on in the pans. Yeah. These pans are cooking. New bread power concentrate. Try again, but now we're confused. What is class war? Is this class war? Yes, this is class war. And I'm just a kid. Whoa! There we go. Man, DRMC rules. That was sick. DRMC fucking rules. Such that was great. Classic voice, also underrated. Yes, I think. we don't talk about that enough. Very sick. I just can never believe. I mean, it's I say it every time about so many of these songs, but like the DRMC stuff is also so consistently that where you're like that all happens in a weekend. I know. I know. That's pretty fucking crazy. And it all happens for five dollars a month at one fifty five pod Patreon. Mm. And you get bonus episodes. And mm. I mean, I just always think about that. I'm like, I can't believe these damn bonus episodes that happen every week. I mean, this week's bonus episode was pretty good. Actually, we could say next week. I, I don't, I'm not going to tell you. Well, maybe I shouldn't say it yet, but we might not get to it, it all. We're going we're gonna to do a mailbag next week for our bonus yeah, episode. Yeah, so. we should say that. Yeah, so like, okay. Uh, we'll we'll say the details in, in Discord. We'll, we'll let you know in Discord yeah. how we're going to do it. But we'll do a mailbag episode next week and... You know, I'm sure that'll be great. Can't wait. I'm excited because it uh, just makes me feel popular. It's true. Mailbag. Scrotum. Not necessarily mail. Just kind of, you know. I was just going to like kind of let that hang. I was like, I feel like you're trying to get to a ball joke. <laughs> Exclusive <laughs> rare demo. Mailbag and then just let and it And we hang. thought that Winnipeg trains were a bad idea. Considering what Clive Holden's Trains of Winnipeg would sound like as a propaganda song. John K. Sampson did play on Holden's original backing track. See, all this John K. Sampson and this Greg guy you were talking about earlier, I, I feel like I'm not ready to be thinking about all the offshoots. Like the, I feel like I still need to get used to the propaganda cinematic universe before I can start getting into the B and C tiers of it all, you know? Yeah, that's, that's fair. I'm the train of my face. I don't want to go now. 
Oh, this is sick, though. I am a train of weather. My roaring engine, steel and wheel, the fire, the crash, the size, my hand. This is the most the brave new waves I've ever felt in this cover I'm section. I'm a train of Winnipeg. I'm coupling ice and field and mountains, lakes and Shut up, Patty rain. Schmidt. I ask for you, Ian. I am a train of Winnipeg. Your brightness switches third. I mean... Hell yeah. Respect. Wow. Okay, so Trains of Winnipeg uh, is a film and multimedia art project by Clive Holden released in stages between 2001 and 2004. So that was like extremely, that was definitely Brave New Waves. Yeah, like also, yeah, like Winnipeg film shit, like My Winnipeg or whatever. Uh, I've never seen uh, that. The worst movie ever made. I, uh, I'm not going to watch that, but I mean. Guy Madden. Yeah, More like, I'm like, Madden. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You get his ass. Uh, <laughs> he's no Don McKellar, that's for sure. I'm um, next is Hockey Sweater with Country Sir Tom. Uh, this is, behold, the debut <laughs> of Hockey Sweater, a reading selection from Less Talk, More Rock liner notes, accompanied by a cacophony of sounds. Jesus saves, Gretzky scores. Uh, and so you, is this one of the guys in this yeah, Never that's mind. Chris Hanna. In my mind, everyone knows what propaganda looks like. I mean, that's Chris Hanna kind in, of what in, I a, in a Maple Leafs Christmas sweater. Big Toronto Maple Leafs fan, Chris Hanna. Yeah, he, I expected him to kind of look like a librarian. So that makes sense. It works. It tracks. He looks cool, though. He's actually really he killing, that, the, killing it with that sweater right there. Yeah, he's a cool looking guy. Okay, here we go. Still like big time Brave New Waves vibes. I feel yeah, like we should, totally. someone should be getting a government grant for this episode. And if it's not me, then I take that back. But wait, does propaganda get like factor money or anything? I mean, I feel like everybody gets factor money, but I'm trying to conjure the back of a propaganda CD and I can't, I can't picture it. Maybe they don't. Maybe I'm they don't. That they, I mean, I'm not trying to do a gotcha thing. I, uh, either way, like, get that bread, fam. Respect. Bring I'm it back not, to Winnipeg. That's I mean, tight. all of those factor grants are, like, it's all made public. The more money that goes to Winnipeg, the more money we get to keep Polo Park open. And that's all I care about. So They did, they did win um, a national songwriting prize in 2006. They won, uh, they won SoCan's first annual Echo Songwriting Prize. And they didn't donate um, it to the prisoners. <laughs> and they beat, uh, they did not, they beat Laura Barrett, Final Fantasy, Owen Pallet, um, The Stills, and Wolf Parade. So according to SoCan, Propaganda are better songwriters than all those people, which is true. Also, speculative fiction is, that's a top five Propaganda song. Yeah, right. A very like, funny song. I'd like to see all of your top fives written out in stone. I'm gonna do it. <laughs> Dude, that's a that's a that's an all time funny propaganda song. Witness yeah. protection is the next one, not the witness protection program. I wish, but it's called witness protection. And we thought the Nash was a bad idea, so finally another Nash joke. There's somebody in witness protection here on the on the album art, and some truly uh, like deep drop shadow on the text as well. That's like some serious <laughs> <Yeah>. drop shadow. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Okay.
Cool synths. Fuck <laughs> <Sick>. yeah. <laughs> Kind of sounded like a art school delocated kind of uh, delivery. I, I think, I think more people should use that vocal effect. Honestly, let's get some more uh, anonymity that's not so artful, but just kind of sounds like prison or cops are doing it or whatever. Yeah, more spooky anons. Desiree Path, or is it Desire Path? I think it's Desiree. No one's corrected me either way, so you know, let me know if I'm fucking it up. I think it's Desiree Path. Who writes? Well, you're fucking it up generally. Yeah. I mean, where am I right now? I struggled heavily forever with this one and nearly gave up. Also, I ran out of alone time in the house this weekend, so could only recover whisper vocals. So I turned up the dry gain high enough that I had to go back and edit out mouth sounds. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So we're listening to the outro of this four-minute conversation called They Own Us. I don't know what I expected based on that description, but it like wasn't that because that oh, just really? sounded like it sounded like that was exactly how it was supposed to sound. Yeah, I agree. Like, I expected something that'd be like <laughs> right, like our, like our, our fucking ASMR episode, just like too <laughs> spooky. No, that was I agree. That was that sounded very intentional, and also I love when particularly like a piano or whatever that was is I think slowed down or it edited in some way where it kind of sounds like a broken harpsichord and that's what that sounded like it was mm. so he's like kind of medieval in a scary way that was so cool and haunting and beautiful it's very good very very yeah, that good was um cool okay i'm next diana spouse this is a nation state never leave open see the thing is i don't remember what the song is called so i don't know if these are this is a change right it's not the yeah that's a change it's a. Uh... I assume a weaker than's reference. They have a song called This is a Fire Door Never Leave Open. All right, Diane Spouse, let's go. Try again, but now we're confused. What is class war? Is this class war? Yes, this is class war. That's beautiful. Is that what the weaker? I've never heard the weaker thans either. Is that what they sound like? Uh, that's the. That's like not how the weaker thans sound, but that is like a weaker thans melody. Because uh, I love melody from that song, but it's like I feel like you would really like the weaker thans. I know, yeah. but I feel but like I might have heard a little bit of it. I say I've never heard things before, but I, what I mean is I've heard like fifteen seconds and thought it sounded bad. Usually, listen. Everyone to tells you to listen to the cat songs, which like fine, but like at once. The weaker they start being on Epitaph and the record starts sounding good. Like, they're great. All of their records are fucking great. Label mates but like this skip the foreplay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically, it's like sad sort of poetic songs about cats and, you know, <laughs> Thoreau or whatever. But with, like, huge trance synths. <laughs> um, well, you know, the first two weaker Than's records are, like, 
perfect, beautiful things. And yeah. I actually think you would really like them. I do think you would really like them a lot. Well, I like Diana Espas a lot. The production of that was incredible. And the I singing, sounded, that was fucking fantastic. The beautiful singing and, oh, my God, it was, it was perfect. So good. Okay, Sean Mendes is lawyer's best friend. I hate neocolonials. And the description says, there's only one thing I know about propaganda. So um, we're about to find out. <laughs> This is another Weaker Dance reference. So the guy from the Weaker Dance was like in Propaganda earlier on. He was the bass player on the first two records, including this song. And do they have beef with him? No, they're fine. But I think it's like a little weird. Because there's only like five people like in totally, Winnipeg. T- yeah, it never seems like totally chill, but like G7 put out Weaker Dance records. Like they obviously were fine. I think, like, John Sampson spent a huge portion of... I gotta say, this is one of the strongest Sean Mendez's Lawyer's Best Friend tracks I've heard. This one, great. I love the ambiance. Beautiful. Wow, I mean... That was I, fucking fantastic, yeah. I don't know if I like The Weaker Thans, but I definitely like people referencing The Weaker Thans via the pod. So that's something. I mean, this is not the first. I think I feel like there was like another cover. I can't even remember which song that also transposed the melody. I think it was like a Bill Verstein cover that transposed the melody into One Great City. Pretty pretty sure that happened, but I, I don't really know what happens week to week on the pod. But yeah, I'm pretty sure. Basically Do you know like Bill Simpson's from Silverstein's been, address that we could say? Yeah, I, I, I'll share it behind the paywall. Um, I I think. John Sampson spent like years after leaving Propagandi having Propagandi songs like yelled at him while he was playing songs like that, you know? Oh, that's got to be annoying because it takes for fucking, it him. takes forever to say the title. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Say, it has a huge amount of just sort of time. So um, Let's talk more rock and that's just uh, them saying the damn song titles before they played them. It's true, yeah. Um, Teen Jazz says, and we thought that Nation States sounded familiar. I made an obvious choice this week, but I figured this was the right opportunity to cover two of my absolute favorite bands in one shot. I wonder, are we just in the weaker than zone here? Is this also weaker than reference? Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. If it sounded familiar. I, I don't. I can't think of if that's a reference. Subsidized, privately profitable. Yes. This is another weaker than zone. Wow, that's so interesting. How this happens? Puppeteer, untouchable. Focus a moment. The last two Weaker Dance references were submitted within an hour of each other from the same no, province. All three, all three of these are Weaker The last, Yeah, three, I know. Like, like the next one was uh, about four hours after. I'm just looking at the submission time, but it's interesting but you how that happens. You organize these because you also no, no, know yeah. what to their beat. Just no. three songs in a row, different. Just pod magic happening. Try I should shut the fuck up here. Now we're confused. What is class war? Is this class war? Yes, this is class war, and I'm just a kid. I can't believe I have to worry about this type of shit. What a stupid world. Nice, like, sparse chords. Yeah. Beautiful. Totally. So tasteful. Like, you're going to fucking love the weaker dance yeah, when you get there. Yeah. Well, I'm just not going to listen. That's fine. I, just, <laughs> I don't want to learn about new things. Um... That was beautiful. I loved it. I'm a little disappointed that I don't think anyone turned I'm Just a Kid into anything, but that's okay. <laughs> it's, I didn't hear it until you said it, and then every time people got to it, I was like, life, life is a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, that's the same lyrics, essentially, but I think mm. Simple Plan was a little more succinct with it, to be honest. Um, that's true. The Silver Bullets, Chris and John featuring WWA and Gnome. So this is some real G7 <laughs> shit. This is like some modern G7 shit. Let's go. <laughs> yes! <laughs> this, is this is four minutes and 20 seconds long. <laughs> Where's the Wii Scandal stuff? Not gonna happen? (laughs) 
Oh wait, the Silver Bullets is not the Wii scandal artist. No, and because I think WWA is not Wii. It's, right. Um, I was just thinking of the, the, the letter W. Well, because <laughs> okay, so good. I'll be honest. So, so that was fucking incredible. Chris and John, obviously John Sampson, Chris Hanna, Gnome. Who knows who that could be? What is what is WWA in this context? Because all the all the all the peanuts of is the Vince. Oh, maybe it's worldwide Ron. anthem. Maybe this is a, maybe this turns into a globe health thing. Oh, okay, because it's the, what is it, Vince Vince G- Vince Geraldi Vince Geraldi right, trio. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't it funny how Noam Chomsky like is now just a guy who people will, like email and are like, "What did you think of Tenet, Mister Professor Chomsky?" And he'll be like, <laughs> "Oh, I do not believe I have procured this film to have an opinion." And then they've screenshot it and everyone. Someone should screenshot some Noam Chomsky one fifty five emails. That would be helpful. Totally, I think. It doesn't like Noam Chomsky seem like he shouldn't exist? Like I feel like the fact that like. No, Trump's keeps. I mean, that sounds like an explicit large. threat that Sam's just made. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Just like uh, it just feels like Santa or something. Where like you're a kid and people are like, mm, Noam Chomsky. Like it's like finding out that like <laughs> Karl Marx is still alive. It's like you could if you could email Karl Marx. He's like Noam Chomsky's like the Neil deGrasse Tyson of uh, hating brains. I think in the same <laughs> way that Neil deGrasse Tyson is like actually God is impossible. Noam Chomsky, he's like, um, Cheetos are bad, or whatever he says about brands. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, brands are bad, it. but... I think you nailed it. Also, shout out Nike. Okay, Sparkling Caleb with Andwe. This was recorded in one take at the home of Michelangelo Durnt in Woodside, mm. Queens. Let's go. Fascinating way of interpolating the chords or whatever. Stupid world. And that was, and we thought the nation states were a bad idea. 